basic Marxist theory going up there. If you actually read volume one of Capital, that's what you would get. Desire the spectacle. I really like Guy Debord. He passed away in 1991, another example of what happens when Frenchmen drink too much wine. <laughs> However, he was an art critic. And because he was an art critic with a real interest in Marxism, he created a theory of the economics based on mass media that focused on the effect of mass media in, a, in our modern economic system. So he said, this is a rough paraphrase of his phrases. In a modern capitalist society, life is dominated by images, I would say, of things being used by people. Right? I mean, if I want to sell, say, blended, you know, Canadian club whiskey, blended, blended whiskey, right? I'm not just going to show you a picture of the bottle. I'm going to show you some apparently uh, successful people drinking it, right? See what I'm saying? You think about it now. Every, most images of products that you actually see, if it's a car or a pair of shoes or a bottle of whiskey or cigarettes or, you know, anything, legal services, it shows people. And the idea being that these images are so important, they actually are the way we relate with each other. All you have to know, I'm sure every one of us probably has a friend who thinks that Apple products are incredible and thinks nothing of spending the over, you know, two nights sitting out in front of the store or whatever just to get his latest Apple product. And as I said, what the board pointed out was that these things being used by people convince us that owning a thing, whatever it may be, will transform our lives. It'll make us happier, you know, more popular, maybe more sexy, maybe, maybe people will think we're more, more intelligent, um, you know, whatever. However, because things can only be made profitably in large numbers, we are coming to modern capitalist society with mass production. Those things become undesirable as soon as they're sold. We all know the person who's like, yeah, can you buy, I'm gonna buy my iPhone 3 from me? I want to get the iPhone 4. That leads to both waste and pollution as well as excessive energy use. Because, of course, making the thing, whatever it is, from a car to an iPhone, uses energy, produces pollution. Even, I didn't get the numbers, I was kind of curious how much pollution is being produced by just solar cell panels. But I'm sure you'd be surprised. Even a totally green thing, like a solar cell panel, I mean, for God's sakes, it's got gallium arsenide in it, is going to produce pollution. Which obviously is part of the you know the part of the effect of making it. So it means making it make it last a long time. Or a wind generator. A wind generator. You might think, well, that doesn't produce any pollution, right, Hannah? Yeah, except for the lubrication that goes whipping around inside. You actually see these machines? You'll see they use a lot of grease. All right, that's not. Or and of course, there's energy and pollution producing the the thing itself. That also, that overconsumption that leads to excessive work, social alienation, which of course is that feeling of, you know, don't worry about, you know, I'm not going to worry about you, I got all I care about me, or I got more troubles, or, you know, you're, you're, you're up here on your own. And of course, popular support for, I put another word, capital suppression, imperialism, militarism, and war. Otherwise known as, why do people watch Fox News and vote Republican? <laughs> because they're trapped in this cycle. And of course, that's okay, because even though the thing is no longer undesirable, as you know, there's those images tell you to buy more stuff, work harder, be more focused on earning money, cutting your tax, you know, voting for politicians who promise to cut your taxes, that kind of stuff, right? So that you can go out and buy more stuff. Oh, and by the way, then of course women create the next generation of workers. I'm a gender scholar, I have to remember, forget women are in this picture too. Alright, ways to escape, just some ideas. 
One, of course, is do it yourself. And um, another is, um, oh, thanks, is um, just an idea. It's life hacking. Check, if you don't know what life hacking is, go check the web. Uh, there's a really cool site. And you'll be like, you'll like, read this, and I'm sure you'll be like, shoot, I didn't know you could do that with this. Um, freeganism, that's, uh, that's, if you haven't heard that, freegan, that's the idea of, of uh, just finding stuff and uh, using it for free. Or you could also call it, we used to call it reuse. Um, then there's just different ways to organize, to organize a, what may seem like a business without a, uh, without having a use, without profit, whether that's a non-profit organization or cooperatives. Or I mentioned government. Now remember, what is a nonprofit organization? What is government really? Is it but a nonprofit organization that doesn't that you that is that's mandatory? You have to belong to it. You have to pay for it, if you will. Right? I mean, a brief example of that is uh, none of us remember this, but up until the early 20th century, at least the late 19th century, it was really common to have no city fire department. How, so if you wanted fire protection, you would have to pay for it in advance, you know, once a year, like everything else. If you didn't, your house would just burn, your stuff would just burn down. What are the problems with that? You might, of course, is that first thing, and also, of course, there was free entry. So guess what happens? Certain neighborhoods have more than one fire department trying to protect them, competing against each other. Other places have got no fire protection. Hence the volunteer fire departments that we're all familiar with. That's where they originate from. And, um, and by the way, and, and of course, the thing is, of course, is that uh, there are, believe it or not, there are actually documented instances in which fire company members actually fought with each other physically because they would get a bonus if they put the fire out, so they would they'd have to fight over the right to fight to fight the fire. Well, the fire is going on. Um, and another problem of course was sheer cost. You probably know this if you think about our healthcare system, which kind of works the same way now, is that the um, the cost of advertising, the cost of management is so much higher than the cost of having what we have now, which is just there's a fire department I'm sorry about that, the cable is broken. It's uh, spaced around evenly, right, all over the place. There's, you know, it's uh, because you actually paid more for your fire protection than you do now under our city mandatory system. But as you well know, uh, nobody else can enter the business of firefighting. Let's also point out that while we're talking about do-it-yourself and life hacking, and there's also something called recuperation which is the fact that, you know, the, one of the great ironies in the world is there's, there are people who are, you know, paid uh, next to nothing to make t-shirts that have Che Guevara, the famous Central American revolutionary's picture on them. Or another example, though, would be gangster rap. I mean, in my time, gangster rap was a real legitimate expression by real genuine artists, in my opinion, like 1984, 85. But today... It's nothing more than a, than a, also it, it really criticized society in 1984-85. You know, like, sometimes they say, wonder how I keep from going under. Remember? Game Master Flash? And today, what is gangster rap about? It's about antisocial behavior. It encourages social alienation. It has, it never criticizes capitalism. Right? And, uh, and I'm not to take away someone's right to free speech, but the facts are that it's not, it, it, is, it is an example of recuperation. Long ago, long ago, gangster rap, rap was, re was well, actually just rap. If you go back to, you know, Rapper's Delight and stuff like that, rap was, was, was uh, recuperated by mass media. Briefly, now we're on the second page, second period. Principles of aggressivism, 
If you've never asked yourself, what is progressivism? And I can tell you, you know, lots of times people use it all the time, they never explain it. But if you actually see what it is, as far as I'm, I'm going to make the argument that it's about social progress, which means progressivism is not necessarily left wing or right wing, because it's not really focused on those sort of things. It's focused on moving society forward and keeping it from falling backwards. And therefore, it's not liberalism. It's, I would say it's not. I have an article, by the way. Thank you. Sure. Well, I'll, sure. The question was, what do you mean by forward? Which I was hoping to slip by that. <laughs> if you want to know, if, I would suggest go read the speeches of Martin Luther King, because he uses the phrase progress. Phrases like social progress will not roll in on the wheels of inevitability. And if you read him further, then you know what he's talking about. Social justice, people being able to take care of their children and their wives and their families, getting education, um, of course, being free of discrimination, a democratic government that's responsive to them, not having wars all the time, these sort of things. So what I'm saying is progressivism is not liberals who don't want to be called liberals. It's not socialists who don't want to be called socialists. It's not libertarianism. It's not just left of liberalism. And it's not anarchism. I wrote an article, by the way, it's called uh, Defining a Second Progressive Movement. And I uh, welcome to read it. It's online. It's, it's at www.nationalprogressive.org. And my website is nationalprogressivereview.org, which you can remember as the new NPR. Um, and this was the 12 point summary of what I thought progressivism is. First, it is that if you, if you have a kid here, Number one, if you've got a social problem, you have to solve it socially. A great example, and I'm going to give a shout out to C. Wright Mills, if you ever heard of him. C. Wright Mills, Sociological Imagination. He said, consider unemployment. If you live in a city of a million people, and you're the only one who doesn't have work and looking for it, then you're probably lazy and you need to work harder finding a job. But if a third of the people in your town are out of work, there's really no point in kicking yourself for not finding a job because there are these hundreds of thousands of other people with no work, right? And that's not an exaggeration. I lived in a county like that. So, 13% unemployment. Uh, so that we have to work together if we're going to solve social problems, any social problem, from firefighting to overcoming Wall Street. Number two, you have to keep theory in perspective. I believe this is the biggest problem with so-called conservatism today, is that they have these theories which they treat as the truth without ever considering it. I'll give you a quick example of that. They'll say, for instance, that they think that it's good to have choice. So, for them, instance, the reason why they don't want to have single-payer health care, or for that matter, Obamacare, is because it will destroy choice in health care. Think of this. I was stunned by the statistic. Before the 2007 crash, there were over 400 types and brands of toothpaste being made in the United States. Today, there are less than 300 because of the market falling. Was your life enriched by having 400 kinds of toothpaste to buy? I mean, do you know what it's like to stand in front of a... I can tell you what it's like. You stand in 
Am I going to buy two? Oh, that one comes with a, with a free toothbrush. And, you know, and so on and so on and so on. And you sit there and you stare at the, and you, know, and you spend so much time wasted with deciding what brand of toothpaste to buy. At least that's me. Or another one, of course, is, yeah, I got a choice about where to fly. On a, you ever try to fly on a, make, make, or, uh, think about you tried next to, last time you tried to make a trip on an airplane? And you sit there, and it's a reasonably complicated trip, right? And you sit there thinking, which, which, like here, right? Do I fly through Seattle? Do I fly through LA? Do I fly through, right? You know, which, which airline, which, which airline to take, and which airport to go through, and, and how long do I stay, and, right? I mean, when I was a kid, I remember when we had things called travel agents. You called them up, you told them where you were going to go, you told them how long you're right, you told them when you want to go and when you want to get back, and two hours later they had the whole thing worked out. You didn't have a lot of choice, but you wasted, you saved a lot of time. Okay. Number three, seek the greatest good for the most people. This is classic Benthamism. If you don't know what that is, greatest good for the greatest number. Number four, thank you. Conserving for a better future which I like because that means education is an example of using our resources today to educate our children so that they'll be more productive in the future. But so is environmental protection, right? We don't cut down all the trees, so we're going to have more tr uh, some trees to cut down in the future. We don't, use, we don't eat all the fish today, so we can eat some more fish later. So we can serve to have a better future. Number five, basing policy decisions on science. I don't just mean, of course, uh, you know, like some of our Republican uh, legislators actually, or candidates actually say uh, that they don't believe in evolution. That's one example of this. But in general, as you'll see, I'm going to talk about numbers and science, and you may have some doubts, but when you don't answer me with some science of your own, it's very difficult to have, an, have any kind of discussion or have any kind of enlightenment. So we call for making decisions based on science. We don't know all the answers, but we're going to make less mistakes if we start with science. Number six, government is not inherently evil. Evil government isn't evil. Is it evil? Inefficient government isn't evil? But the answer is not to destroy the government. The answer is to fix the government. Number five, seven. That's number seven there. Expediency and efficiency determine government size. Yes, question. Uh, there is none. Seriously, seriously. Yeah, state and government are, are would be the same. Number eight, no abuse of corporations or individuals. Uh, meaning, it's not that all corporations are bad, but that if they're not regulated well, we just discussed earlier, right? They're going to get bad. Because someone, if someone's going to run a corporation badly. Same thing for individuals. Uh, nine, participatory democracy. Let's have a show of hands. I know a lot of the graybeards have heard of, of uh, participatory democracy, right? Yay. Yeah, Pavel, right? Participatory democracy is, is an idea from the early 60s and 60s. It's not just voting. It's saying that big decisions should be made if they affect a lot of people, they should not be made by, you know, 10 people, highly paid board members in a corporate board office, you know, in, in behind closed doors. Like, you know, but they should be made by everybody in a perspective, particularly like workers. So that's a radical concept. Number 10, public decisions should be made democratically. 10 should not be even on there, except that we've got voter fraud, voter ID laws, election fraud going on, things like that. So yeah, let's remember that government that does not, is not voted on by everybody isn't in fact a legitimate government. Number 11, property rights are social construction. That completely flies in the face of libertarianism. But I can tell you as a lawyer, there is, God did not make property law. All right? Property rights exist because that's an efficient way to divide up things like land and personal property. We agree to them, but I believe we can change them at will. 
within the limits of the Fifth Amendment of the United States Constitution, which is uh, uh, no taking without, uh, no taking except for public purpose with, ju with just compensation. Yes. Um, so, for five years of uh, policy based on science, yep. what about uh, the role history plays in the course of, say, a society or human evolution? So, well, the question is, what is uh, the role history plays? And, and, and that's really great, because frankly, that's what I meant by number two. This is why I'm, I always talk history. You know me, I'm, I'll bore you with history. Because to me, history is like a lab book. It's like it tells us what worked in the past. And what didn't work in the past, and why it didn't work. Which is also why we need to have well-funded, and we need to keep uh, politicians out of history research. Finally, number 12, freedom is the right to live under equal rules. In other words, freedom is not what you might have thought beforehand, which is I got the right to do whatever I want. But in fact, that everybody follows the same rules, which of course we have decided democratically. This, by the way, is the idea of John Locke. And if you ever heard of him, 1690, two treaties of civil government, our, our democracy, yes? was some governments are not fixable. And that's true. But those governments are not democratic. I mean, I think, I think that would, that would be my answer to is that somewhere in there is some unjust privilege, some unrepresentativeness, something like that. Um, you know, I've been thinking about, you know, the Roman Empire, you know, didn't actually fall in the sense of, you might be thinking, well, it fell because all those barbarians came and they burned everything and this that's not where it happened. What really happened was people in places like England and France and, 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 uh, and Spain and whatever, what is now those countries, decided that they didn't want to keep paying taxes to support a big government in, in, in Rome because it wasn't meeting their needs. And that's what happened to Europe. And in fact, if you went to Italy, there really isn't a line between, you can't really tell where the Roman Empire ends and modern Italy begins because that's just what sort of happened, you know, that the central, right, Rome, the Roman Empire fell, but Italy continued. So, uh, just briefly a re recount of what I talked about. But what we're talking about here is don't just kind of ignore experience. I said that's history. Invest in concern for a better future and base policies and decisions on science. Now we're going to get to what we were here to talk about, which is I hope you, you got some value there, because what I was talking about here was, uh, I don't think it's been discussed much, and, you know, especially not, you know, actually anywhere. Uh, I don't know what they've been talking about over at Wall Street. Okay, we're going to move on. Well, nevertheless, so I want to briefly talk about what auto-oriented design is. In other words, what kind of communities you want to live in, in the future. And also, you just give me some numbers on land, energy, and materials used compared. And they compare bus and rail, although I don't think I've used piping. Why is it that I'm so against cars? Oh, it's about, uh, it's Give me two examples. Remember I told you I'm a test engineer? Test engineer. This is a parking stall. Okay? A parking stall has to be 10 to 12 feet wide, because people are about 3 feet wide. And the car is 6.5 feet wide. And it's 20 feet long, because that's how long we have to accommodate different kinds of cars. And you need about 10 extra feet here, and then of course you need 10 more feet here, so you can turn the car out. That's the most efficient way to park a car. And that is space for one car, or up to six motorcycles. That means you can back them in and out without moving all the others out of the way. Nine bicycles, if you include this space over here. 
or 35 people if they're standing with luggage, baggage, you know, that sort of thing. That's a very conservative low number there, 35 people. Around the on the cars and stuff. Well, of course, um, that was just a regular parking stall. Is that right? Which which yeah, you think he has? Yeah. yeah, right. Yeah, of course, you know, more space if it's a handicapped spot. So, in one acre of land, this consists of 43,560 square feet. You can put 145 cars. You can park 145 cars on that. You can park 871 motorcycles. 1,305 bicycles. Or you can put 5,000 people in there. That's 200, okay? Or another way of looking at it is, if I've got a building which attracts 5,000 people and they came at 1.2 persons per car, I'm going to need, they're going to come in over 4,000 cars and I'm going to need 29 acres of parking. Which gives you an idea why suburbia looks the way it does. Because this, is auto-oriented design. One, sorry. Oh, one other thing. This is street traffic. If you didn't know, the most efficient way to run vehicles is 30 miles an hour. If they're slower, you don't get the you don't get the volume. And on a freeway, these numbers get much even worse than this. So, you need a 12-foot lane, 20 feet. You need 88 feet between cars. Two seconds. You have one car. You get four motorcycles in that space. 14 bicycles if they're going 10 miles an hour, or 72 pedestrians. This is Odding Orchard Design. The number one element, you know, think about the word drive-through, right? The number one element of an auto oriented design is it has fast assets of roads and highways. It's a building that's set out there, surrounded by parking. You can so Ideally, you can drive into it, and you can get out of there as fast as possible. And you can get on your way to the next building with a lot of parking around it. It means the most parking possible is near the building entrance. It means the transit, cycle, and pedestrian access is ignored, or it's an afterthought. We all know that, right? The building has a bus stop half a block away, out there somewhere. And to get into this building, you have to like dodge cars coming in and out. You know, it's like getting 4:30. Don't forget cul-de-sacs and fences that block access. And finally, public space gets privatized. Transit-oriented design is where you have transit, cycle, and pedestrian access prioritized over autos. Your conflicts with autos are minimized. Walking and cycling just to minimize. That means the buildings themselves look different. They uh, have lots of. Uh, they're designed for walking. Okay. And public spaces encourage interaction. Another thing to talk about. I'm going to skip the last section on this. Living streets. Uh, how many of you heard of the Complete Streets Ordinance? A little bit of that. And um, we'll take you further. And that's living streets, where you can actually encourage the street to be used for other than transportation. Obviously, it's narrow, slow streets. But it started in the Netherlands. It's been used in the United States as well. They use the space for everything. They literally post signs that tell children, play here. They post, they put bike or bicycle racks. They put benches, trash cans, right, in the side, right on the side of the road. So you can't, it encourages you not to drive fast. And then there are cycle tracks which are special roads or full road lanes. Some of you have been on the lived on the mainland have seen some really innovative designs where uh, cycles are deliberately encouraged, they're giving priority over auto traffic. Uh, all these things, of course, slow down auto traffic, which makes the road safer for everybody else. And that, of course, is the ultimate problem with the ultimate goal of city streets is uh, to make, make the road safer for everybody, not just people driving. Sorry, I think we want to throw this in. 
You got some numbers I'm going to give out to you. 28% of the U.S. energy consumption is for transportation. 82% of that is used by cars and trucks. The remaining 0.7 is used by buses. Now, this is from the uh, Department of Energy. I don't can't quite believe that 1.55 persons is the average car occupancy. I don't believe that. But if it is, it's 3,538 BTUs per passenger mile. Light trucks are a little bit higher than that, but also uh, they hire him more people. Buses, the average bus apparently carries 9.2 people at any one time. Our, our buses are way over that, I think. That's why the, the BTU is so high per passenger mile. As I point out, if you could get 40 people on it, that's just filling up all the seats. That goes all the way down to 976. In rail transit, the average train is carrying 24 and a half people per car. And that's 2,516. Or, as I said, you have 60 people, so you can see how that works. You can see how important it is basically to load up your vehicle. Because just driving empty around is, is not saving energy at all. Another thing, pollution. A lot of people think pollution, oh, I forgot to mention noise. Oh, I put, didn't put noise on here. Noise. Pollution is from cars in a lot of sources. Carbon dioxide, volatile organics, evaporated fuel and spilled fuel, nitrogen oxides, carbon dioxide, particularly from tires is a big factor. You get lubricant and road erosion, which pollutes water. And uh, also, of course, the energy from just making the car itself, making the tires, making all the disposable products, uses up a lot of energy. Okay, that's it. So, those are giving them a side. We don't have the time to talk about. No, all right. Sorry. Just a minutes. These are some numbers on the rapid transit system. Our current bus system carries 252,000 people a, a weekday. Uh, with rail, that's projected to go to 453,000. Without rail, that's only going to be 314,000. Roughly population increase. Total transit trips. This is the thing. Remember, those are boardings. So that gives you an idea. If you divide the number, I get 252,000, and you divide by 184, it gives you an idea how many bus trips involve a transfer. And I like to point out 42% of transit trips will include rail. We can calculate that out. And the last is sources of transit rail. This is the biggest reason why things like elevated carpool lanes and things are not a good idea. Because look, as you can see, the idea that somehow all we really need to solve our transit problem, transportation problem, is a, basically a funnel starting at East Kapolei and running downtown. It's like, look how many people are going to be going to work and school and stuff, boarding the train at places like, you know, especially here on the east side of, in, in our city, right? But well before downtown. Um, airport, Lagoon, a lot of jobs in Lagoon Drive, a lot of jobs in Pearl Harbor. And the last is, this is Pearl Highlands, and basically that is everybody coming from Middle Lani and, and Wyla. 9%. So you can see, and then 19% gives you an idea how many people are going to go to Waikiki, going to go to UH, and places like that. So uh, that's all I have to share with you. I appreciate your time, and you had some great questions and discussion, and I'm sure I have more time. Aloha. Thank you. And one thanks to everyone who came out here and took some time off. I know you guys are busy, busy, fancy, important people. Um, <laughs> um, so up next we have Dr. Hector Venezuela. Can we bring him up here, please? Hello, hello, hello. Yay. <laughs> Yeah, and he, I met him at a, who did I meet you? I met you, I forgot where I met you. Where did I meet you? I met, oh, I met you at a board meeting. Makiki board meeting? Yeah. <laughs> and again at a, at a, a GMO thing. So, here you go.
Hi, uh, uh, I would just like to uh, ramble a bit uh, to give you my perspective in terms of uh, what's been going on with the uh, protests around the world and with the Occupy movement. Uh, and then end up with you know, some comments about the high class in the and uh, uh, the food system. Uh, first, I would like to uh, thank and recognize the, uh, the, the Occupy uh, movement, uh, not only here in Hawaii, but also uh, internationally. Uh, I think it was uh, actually a, a pretty big thing. I think there was a, in each state, there was an average of, of over 20 occupied cities in each state. Uh, and in places like California, it's probably in the hundreds. Uh, even though the, the camps have been taken away in many parts of the, in the, of the country, most parts of the country, uh, the Occupy movement continues to be in many ways because it has been centralized and the level of actions continue in many, many ways. Uh, Sukhoi Park is no longer there, but in New York there's daily activities all over the, over, all over the city. Uh, sometimes it's one person, sometimes it's a team, a team of three people uh, to, that have individual actions uh, throughout the city. Uh, in, in Oahu, we have seen the occupied movement attend meetings at UH, uh, attend meetings uh, of interviews of uh, administrators at UH, uh, attending council hearings with the city council. Uh, they have, they have occupied Monsanto in Maui, all sorts of activities. Uh, they have participated at meetings with the board, uh, at, at the neighborhood boards, and they have provided pretty articulate views of the reasons of their existence, the, the, the rights of free speech. Uh, so uh, I really uh, thank and recognize them for, for their work. Also, thank you for the, uh, to the Save Oahu Farmers Coalition. Uh, this was a huge coalition of dozens and dozens of peoples and groups throughout the island that has been organizing for the past few years uh, to try to, to stop development. And uh, I hope the, uh, the, the recent fairly failures that, that we had with the Land Use Commission, Commission just helps to expose the type of uh, system and corruption that we have in the state and, the, and that it just strengthens the movement of the communities uh, so they can continue to educate themselves uh, to fight for uh, rights in, in, the, in, the, in the state. Sometimes when we look at the issue, I think we get lost in minutiae minutia, minutia and small details. So when we talk about uh, the wars and so on in Iraq and Afghanistan, we talk about uh, details of where should we withdraw, what about the drones, what about torture, and sometimes we forget to ask the big questions, which is we shouldn't be at war to, to, to start with. Uh, we shouldn't be invading, invading, invading countries to start with. And when we, when we recently, uh, somebody had a, a few years ago, there was a media interview with Senator Castro, and they asked him, well, after all these years, have you actually rethought your system? Uh, and I thought it was a, a perfectly valid question. Uh, it's something that we have failed to ask ourselves. Uh, so when we talk about the economy and so on, again, we sometimes we get lost. Sometimes we get lost. Uh, sorry. Sometimes we get lost. With the, with the minutia, asking the details about this, about that, uh, but we forget to ask the same questions about ourselves and to ask questions about the economic system. And perhaps we should actually get rid of the entire thing and start something anew. And this is something that we don't ask enough. Uh, raising questions about the, the, the capitalist system, uh, about predatory economics, about the concentration of the of the market in fewer and fewer hands, and. Uh, where, where the, the, the public is almost the forgotten, it's not part of the equation, and, and this is the, uh, the, the 99%. Uh, so if we go back to the, uh, to the days of slavery, uh, I'm sure that if you read the newspapers at the time, there was a lot of discussions of the minutia, more details. Uh, should we perhaps improve the labor conditions? Uh, should we allow them to take Sundays off? Uh, should we allow the, the, the slave families to stay together instead of just uh, separating them? Uh, and so I'm sure there was a lot of minutia, but of course the question from, from the start was, slavery is wrong, there should be no slavery. Uh, we should get rid of that uh, from, 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 to, to start with. And when slavery was actually abolished, uh, it was abolished in, in some aspects, but the, the whole system, the whole social and economic system that allowed it to exist 
what actually was actually allowed to to, to continue. And uh, today we still have remnants of, of the uh, uh, slavery system, and this has consisted of a, a system of persecution and uh, imprisonment of uh, the youth, of the black and Latino youth, uh, throughout the throughout the country over the past 20 years. And we continue to see the remnants of that system today, uh, where the global center of the economy, the global economic center of the world, and the global cultural center of the world, New York City, uh, every year there's 600,000 stop, 600, stop and frisks of you, young black and Latino and other minorities in the, in the, in the, state, in the, in the city of New York. Uh, that means the police say, this, this is a young guy, this is a young male guy, he's, look, he's dressing funny, uh, he has attitude, we're going to stop him and, uh, and frisk, uh, frisk him just for, for, uh, for no reason at all. And this comes to over 1,600 stops and frisks every day. And this accounts to over 70 stop and freeze every hour in the city of New York, uh, just because you happen to be young and a minority. Uh, so again, uh, sometimes we discuss the details, but we forget. Maybe we should to get rid of the entire system. Uh, today, in the United States, uh, we are continued uh, an economic and military system that was started well over a hundred years ago. Uh, so, uh, which started with the taking over the Indian lands, uh, taking over lands from uh, from other countries in Cuba, in Mexico, uh, and today we continue with the same pattern with uh, in invasions or interventions in countries like Afghanistan, Gaza, Yemen, Somalia, and in our own hemisphere in Colombia and in Honduras. Uh, so, when I uh, been talking uh, about uh, when I have talked a few times in the, in the islands, I've been mentioning recently. I've been mentioning how come all the protests that are going on in the Middle East and all over the world that we, that we occupy, and I mentioned well, people are, are realize that they have been swindled uh, year after year, and uh, they are the forgotten 99 percent. Uh, and I, I give the, the example of Egypt. Uh, Egypt is a relatively affluent, it has a lot of resources, uh, but over the past decades, people, the people of Egypt have realized all of the monies, all of the resources from Egypt have gone for a few percent of the people, and that most of the people have lost in terms of healthcare, education, and the same issues that we deal with in the United States. Uh, but if we look at the case of Egypt, we realize that over the past few decades, it has been one of the strongest allies of the United States. And every year, Egypt has been the second recipient of the most foreign aid uh, in the Middle East, second after uh, Israel. And where have all those monies have been going? Have they been going for education or for health care? No, they have actually been going to fortify a, a, a basically a dictatorship consisting of the military uh, with, a, with a head person. Uh, and what were those monies being used for? Those monies were actually being used to repress the population, to keep the population from asking questions about how come we don't have education and so on. Uh, so this background helps to explain why people are feeling so much anger in the Middle East, in the United States, and increasingly all over the world. Recently, there were three elections, and we realized that according to the powers that be, uh, the people elected the wrong person uh, in, in Egypt. Uh, so the military is once again taking over and saying, well, this doesn't count, so we're going to take, take this over. And we can only assume that the military is doing this with the guidance of the United States, uh, the U.S. military. Uh, we know that the U.S. military can just simply tell them, hey, guys, you got to open the doors, and they will do so. Uh, so the question arises. If in the United States we, the people, chose to elect the right person in our minds, uh, would the military allow this to happen, or would they step in just as, as they are advising uh, their puppets to do so in, in, in Egypt? Uh, so when I when I talk a couple of times around the island, I, I bring up 
how come people feel that they have been shafted in the United States or swindled? Uh, so I, I give I give a few examples of, of instances uh, that occur almost on a on a five year basis. Uh, the economy, this economic crisis, but a lot of a lot of a few people are making a lot of money out of this, but the taxpayer is the one that has to come in and fix the mess that is left behind. Uh, so I just give a couple of examples uh, for some old timers like myself. Uh, if you remember the uh, saving and loans crisis of the 1980s, and these resulted as a cause of the deregulation of the financial markets, uh, and these resulted in over 20,000 people losing their life savings, uh, over 2,000 banks going under, and under uh, a loss of 500 of a, half a billion dollars, uh, half a billion dollars to the economy. I think half a 500 billion dollars to the economy. And again, this means that the taxpayer was the one who had to come in and put up all those monies that were lost because of these financial failures. Uh, this is in the 80s. Also in the early, if you remember, uh, the Chrysler, the Chrysler bailout, uh, the bailout of the airlines. Again, the taxpayer is coming in, and in a free market, so-called free market economy, the taxpayer is coming in to fix problems uh, from these big corporations. Later on, we had the dot-com bubble, uh, they had the high-tech bubble. Uh, a few years later. We had the, uh, the energy crisis, uh, Enron, the Enron uh, bailout, fa uh, failure of, of Enron, uh, Arthur Anderson, uh, and you remember Arthur Anderson uh, was at one time the accountant of Anderson, and on the other hand, they were the consultants for Anderson. Uh, so they were trying to make uh, money on the, one on the one hand, and on the other hand, they were trying to look at their accounting books. And it turned out, everything turned out to be just a, a fiasco. Uh, Enron turned out to be a big fiasco. They were making special, how do they call them, special entities, uh, special corporations on this side, on that side, just to manipulate the energy markets. Uh, but in the end, everything turned out to be just a, a bubble. Uh, there was nothing in there. And again, this resulted on hundreds and thousands of families losing their pensions, their, their savings, their life savings, and the taxpayer having to come in and bail out all this uh, financial mess. Uh, and most lately, uh, we had the, uh, the housing crisis, and this, again, was a result of the deregulation of the financial markets. And once again, these were fin finances, big uh, uh, housing units that were making loans to households, to honest households, knowing perfectly well that these people were not going to be able to, to make those payments. Uh, so, again, today we have a, a, a global economic crisis as a result of this housing crisis. Uh, and once again, the corporations, Obama, by the way, was right in his statement that the business is doing fairly well. Uh, corporate profits continue at a, at a high, high pace uh, since I've been tracking them since the early 90s. It's been double digit profits year after year. Uh, profits continue a wash. Uh, the corporations are awash in cash uh, still today, uh, but the people are in, in dire straits. Uh, so I, I believe that uh, the people uh, are starting to walk, wake up, woke up to educate themselves, and this has uh, resulted in the, in, the, in the Occupy movement. Uh, so this uh, just moving on, this moves us on to the, uh, to the food system. And the, the food system and the agricultural system is somewhat the, uh, the, la the last area that hasn't been taken over by, the, uh, by corporations and by, by big business. Uh, and now that the era of oil is coming down, uh, corporations that in, the, in previous years based their, their, their monies or economies on the, on the oil industry uh, producing uh, industrial chemicals uh, or pesticides uh, realized that they have, moved, they have to move on to a new version of the economy which is based on the life sciences and on patenting. And in Hawaii, we ended up being in the center of this uh, discussion uh, because we became a, a, a global center uh, for the testing of uh, genetically modified crops. 
and, and this uh, consists of corporations uh, creating novel organisms, uh, novel plants. They insert new genes, say, in, in the corn plant. Uh, now they can patent those plants. Uh, so from now on, uh, farmers are indebted on an ongoing basis to having to purchase that seed. Uh, the number of varieties that are available to the farmers and to the consumers will be narrowed down to the lowest common denominator. Uh, just like with music, you go to the top 10 songs with food. Uh, if in the old days you like to consume some kind of specialty corn variety or tomato heirloom variety, uh, the future that they are envisioning is to, again to the lowest common denominator. Uh, so they would focus on those products that bring the most money and leave behind those specialties that are not producing uh, all the revenues. You have a question? Uh, yes, uh, what do you think uh, biotech companies or corporations rather, like Monsanto, uh, the effects of them packing their seeds and how that affects biodiversity in plants? Uh, basically, it's, it's a, a direct attack on, on biodiversity and it's totally opposed. It's, it's uh, opposed to the concept of biodiversity. Uh, the system of agriculture that they are promoting is what is called uh, the industrial agriculture or the green revolution, and this consists basically of large-scale monocultures. Uh, currently, there's uh, a lot of land, what is called, what are called land grabs in Latin America, Africa, uh, in the United States itself, in the Midwest, and even here in Hawaii. And the method of agriculture that they envision consists of large-scale monocultures. When you have large-scale monoculture, these entire areas that are covered basically with one or two or three crops. And in biodiversity, uh, we're talking small scale farms uh, where there's 100, 200 different species. Uh, and it's with small scale agriculture, we're not talking only about the farm, but also about the green corridors that are surrounding the farm, like, like a circle, like a, like a ring, and the, and the communities. And each of those surroundings, green corridors, are a source of biodiversity itself. Uh, a lot of times they consist of native plants, uh, native species. Uh, so there's, you create a corridor of native species that, have, that can move from these corridors back to the mountains or to the valleys. Uh, but if there's monocultures, you uh, prevent those habitats from existing. Uh, so one aspect of the, uh, uh, the model of uh, patenting and genetically modified crops is the product defense industry. And the product defense industry is uh, a follow-up that was created basically by the uh, chemical and by the tobacco companies. Uh, there was a lot of challenge in the, in the 60s, 50s and 60s and 70s saying tobacco is bad for us, uh, acid rain is bad for us, the chemicals are bad for us. So the industries created, created the, the product defense industry, which is uh, the universities may be allied to it, or these may be scientists that are funded, uh, or think, ta think tanks that are funded to create uncertainty in the science, uh, claiming that there's harm from these products. Uh, we see the same with the climate, uh, climate change uh, movement. There's a whole uh, group of think tanks that are creating uncertainty to prevent uh, regula regulators to take action and to protect the public from these, from these products. Uh, whether they are pesticides, climate change, uh, products that we're consuming, or lately uh, genetically uh, modified crops. Uh, so today, uh, Hawaii has become a living example of the fight uh, about where, what, where should we actually be, what, what should we actually be doing. Uh, we are rich in resources in the island, in the state. Uh, basically, the main resources are our people. We have some of the best farmers in the world and we are reaching resources in terms of the land and the ocean. And these resources can allow us to flourish for many years if we handle these resources properly. Uh, so in a democratic society, you would think that the, the public would be educated so that we as a community can, be, can make proper decisions about this is what we have done in the past, uh, we can learn from our mistakes, and from now on, we are going to use all this land, all this fresh water, to develop sustainable communities 
that can be resilient and withstand the effect of climate change uh, because we know we can do it. You have another question? Uh, because we, we know that we can develop resilient communities to withstand the, the effects of climate change, such as droughts, uh, floodings, and, and so on. Uh, or are we going to allow these decisions about the future of Hawaii to be made by a few large-scale corporations and their local allies in the state, uh, such as the, uh, the, the, the power industry, the, uh, the, the landowners, uh, the, the power brokers in the state, the politicians, uh, the university leaders. Uh, so basically, all of these issues that we are addressing on a global basis are coming down to Hawaii, and uh, I hope that we can uh, continue to educate ourselves uh, at a community level and throughout the state uh, to tell people what's going on, because most people out there, we, if we go to the sidewalks and talk to people, most people don't are not aware of co PV, they're not aware of co Coa Ridge, uh, they're not aware of, uh, of genetically modified crops, about industrial agriculture, and about uh, the food that we're consuming. Uh, we know that our, our diets are the wrong diets, the, the food that we're giving our children are the, is the wrong diet, the wrong food. Uh, we have monoculture in the fields, we have monoculture in our diets, and we have a monoculture in our education. Uh, so uh, it's a time for us to change around and uh, develop a, a new future and occupy Honolulu today as the focal point for, for this change. So the, the question is is about Monsanto and to, and to explain what 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 is what are they be, what is behind uh, where's the economy behind what they're trying to do what what is what is the agenda? So Monsanto, uh, Dow Chemicals, and Genta, all of these are were in these in the, from the 50s. They were large agrochemical corporations. They produced industrial chemicals uh, and pesticides, which, by the way, they borrowed from scientists in Germany during World War II. All of the chemicals that we were experimenting with, they, bar they, they took it, brought it to the U.S., and these companies are, arose from those. These large agrochemicals realized that the energy resources were coming down, and the next version of the economy would be based on the life sciences. Uh, so they realized that if they can insert new traits into plants from one species to another, if they, if they could, can insert, say, a pesticide resistant trait into corn, and if they can patent that plant, that's it. They control the food supply. If they control the seed, you control the future of the economy. Uh, because farmers, basically, food is central to the economy. Food is about uh, two-thirds, the food system is about two-thirds of the economy. We all eat, we all have to consume. McDonald's, all the entertainment, the restaurants are based on, on food. So if these corporations own the seed supply, they basically own the future of food. Uh, so basically they are concentrating at first with the major crops. Uh, today, most of our diet globally is based on 10, 10 crops. So if they can focus on that, those 10 crops, and by the way, now they have six of those 10 crops, they can control a large amount of the food supply. Uh, so they can control not only the seed, but they control the pesticides that they are supplying, and they're in increasingly buying other markets so that they control other aspects of the market. They control parts of the organic market, uh, different aspects of, of, of the, the food industry. Uh, so basically, just a, a, a lot of money down the road. Did I answer your question? So, what are, what, are the, what are the concerns about genetically modified crops? 
Uh, so basically, you insert a tray, say from a bacteria to corn, and this bacteria makes the corn to be resistant to a herbicide. So you don't only insert a tray, tray but to make it work in the plant, you have to insert DNA from other organisms to make that trait function properly. So you insert DNA from viruses, from other bacteria, so you call it a cassette, which a cassette of DNA from different organisms into the plant. So you are creating an organism that has never before existed in nature. So intuitively, you would think, if I'm introducing a new organism into nature, I would ask questions about what could happen from it. And a lot of things can happen from it. It could create new metabolites, new toxins. It's basically called an unintended consequence. Anything can happen, and you would you would think that if you're going to introduce this into the food chain, that you would conduct safety studies, both to the environment and to health. And you come to realize that early in the 80s, when we were in the, the regulatory focus with Reagan and Bush and Quail, uh, we basically deregulated these crops. Uh, so we decided we actually don't need to conduct safety studies because on a political basis they said a genetically modified crop is equivalent to a traditional crop. So if they're equivalent or substantially equivalent, we don't need to conduct safety studies. Uh, so today we are 15 years later, the public is starting to learn about genetically modified crops, but we have not yet conducted the safety studies that we should have conducted before releasing those products. Uh, we know that we've made those mistakes with pesticides. Uh, we ask, well, are these pesticides actually safe to use? Are these residues are safe on our food? And today we are uh, realizing that a lot of those pesticides actually were very harmful to human health. Uh, so the questions that we ask about pesticides, today we are asking about genetically modified crops. Uh, So most of the most of the world actually has uh, regulatory systems that kind of mimic the United States. However, the U.S. was the first to come into market, and they deregulated the market. However, however, other industrialized countries didn't buy that. Uh, so Europe actually put in a lot of more thought into it uh, because they learned about NatCal, where they kind of didn't pay attention to what was going on. So Europe actually looked into it a lot more, and they actually decided, no, we're going to label uh, genetically modified crops. Uh, so today, most of the industrialized world including China, uh, Europe, Japan, Korea, they have labeled. Uh, a lot of other countries from the world, like in Latin, Latin America and Africa, they have kind of looked skeptically at the United States, kind of like a colonial mentality of you guys are telling us what to do, and they have still resisted. Uh, however, if you uh, look at uh, WikiLeaks, at the cables that were released from WikiLeaks, uh, we have seen that the United States is doing as much as it can behind doors to twist the arms of regu regulators in other countries to try to deregulate uh, genetically modified crops. But so far, they haven't been successful. So, from, from, from the big picture, uh, talking about minutia, uh, the question is, can we actually have healthy agriculture, healthy lands, and healthy communities within our current economic system? And, and that, that is a real tough question, and, and it perhaps may be very difficult, if not impossible, to have a, a healthy society, healthy agriculture, within a current predatory capitalist system. Uh, where we leave the powers to be to decide for the community how we're going to take care of the land, uh, where we're going to feed our children, and where we're going to educate our children in schools.
So, so the, uh, the, the, the companies in Hawaii actually make the state a global center for the testing of genetically modified crops. So what they actually do in Hawaii, because they can grow several crops in one year, is do all the experiments to evaluate these varieties. So in the 90s, they actually had pharmaceutical crops. Uh, they had HIV drugs, antidiarrheal drugs that they were testing in Hawaii. Uh, and so they are testing the, 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 the breeding of the varieties, and those that are successful, they will send them to their, to their seed uh, growers in, in Iowa and other parts of the world. And the seed growers are going to expand that seed and then sell it to the farmers. Uh, so Hawaii is more like the experimental site. Uh, but then, nevertheless, they have taken some of the most valuable land uh, for testing these. And the problem is that growing seed involves drenching the fields with pesticides. Because when you're growing seed, that seed has to be totally clean because when you harvest the seed, you don't, you don't want it to be contaminated with weeds or with insects or weevils. So that seed to be clean has to be sprayed almost on a daily basis. Like set six out of ten days, those fields have to be sprayed. Uh, and the question is, only about 1% of the pesticides make it to the target. About 99% of the pesticide goes somewhere else. It goes to the soil, it goes to the air, to the water. Uh, so the question for the communities is, is that pesticide actually eventually going to make it to the aquifers, to the ocean, uh, to, uh, to, uh, to ourselves? And in communities like Waimea in Kauai or in Haleiwa, in Molokai, all you have to do is drive around town and see all the dust blowing over the towns, over the schools. And isn't that dust contaminated with pesticides? And I know I'm not going to fall dead just from taking the pesticide, but 10 years down the road, am I going to develop a chronic disease, cancer, or some other side effects from consuming the, those uh, pesticides? Uh, so the fact that it's noble GM crops plus the chemicals that are raises a lot of questions about, is, it, is this really what we want in Hawaii? A issue that I want to talk about is a lot of times, or I'll just talk about my experience recently at the neighborhood board meeting when the lady came to talk about uh, GMO products she was brought in as a defense because a lot of people had brought up the problems with GMOs before. And she came in, she was a seed producer with a PhD, and she came in and gave a very professional presentation, a very polished presentation, uh, promoting GMOs and such, but um, the, from the get-go, the, the subject was purposely limited to the subject of the labeling of GMOs, which is another one of those minutiae points. I think it's, it's often a, uh, a diversion from talking about the bigger issues such as cancer and what, what GMO food do when they get into our system and, and in the process. If you can speak to that, I appreciate it. I'm going to intervene here. Um, let's keep the Q&A until after. Can we do that? Is everyone okay with that? Yeah, yeah. Cool, you're going to be. Anyway. <laughs> just, just to quickly respond to that. I, I agree with you that you don't want to get lost in minutia, but as a community, you got to educate your neighborhood, you got to educate your friends, but you got to strategize and say, what is our next step? And the next step is labeling. Labeling is like a wedge because if you if those pro, if, if, if these products are labeled, now we can make a choice as consumers. So it would be a step for us to educate our neighbors and say, hey man, you can actually make a choice. Uh, so in this case, it's a good strategic point to say, let's make labeling a central issue uh, because we this is a democratic society uh, and we have the right to know what we're we're consuming. So, mahalo. Thank you.
So, are, are any farmers uh, going to, uh, to planning on suing Monsanto? And I, th I think we have to leave farmers out of the equation because <laughs> farmers are taking care of the land and doing a lot of hard work. But communities themselves are, 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 are have already in Waimea, Kauai. Uh, the community of Waimea has actually uh, sued Pioneer or du DuPont uh, in, in Kauai for uh, over 10 years of, of dust pollution and pesticide pollution. So I think the ball, the ball is starting to roll. Uh, there's a question about other communities, uh, but uh, that's up to the individual communities. But I think we can just leave it for the panel. Uh, I have a question. Um, so who are these companies that are now bringing in the genetically engineered products and now growing it and now are going to monopolize the economy? Who are these companies? Because we can educate ourselves, but we need to know who the companies are so we can hold them accountable. Because this takes years of uh, research and we don't know what the, it will change the makeup of people and create more diseases. So who are these companies? We need to know right at the beginning. So again, these are large multinational companies. We're dealing basically with six major companies. They have a poor record in terms of the products that they have released in the past. Uh, and you can just educate yourself just by starting to Google uh, these companies. Uh, simply Google Bhopal, Bhopal uh, Google um, Agent Orange, uh, Google Aniston, Alabama, and you will learn about the promises that they made back in the 50s to small rural communities about employment, about renewal, economic development, and so on. And today these are wastelands. Uh, so you can, there's a lot of Facebook, Facebooks, GMO Free Oahu, GMO Free Maui. There's a lot of community educational groups. Uh, there's the Occupy Facebook. Uh, so just join those groups and just keep networking with, with the community. Well, my next question is, who owns the land that these companies are here in Hawaii? Okay, these companies are coming in with a big box. And so I want to know who are, who, who are the landowners that are allowing these companies to come in and monopolize. So who are the landowners? Well, I'm not sure who the landowners are. Is it the state? Is it, uh, who, who, who are the large landowners? Uh, don't ask me, they're all the large, the large owners. I think all the power brokers are, are in it, uh, the transportation people, the large, the, land, the landowners, uh, the retail stores. Uh, I know there's a, a movie that has just been released about uh, uh, Kamehameha schools, uh, but in Kauai is Gay, Gay Robinson, but uh, probably all the large landowners are, are involved. <laughs> the downfall of Agent Orange. Uh, Agent Orange was called a herbicide uh, that was used to defoliate areas in, uh, in, 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 in Vietnam, but it was actually a chemical weapon. Uh, the government and the, and the corporations knew perfectly well what they were doing, what they were producing, and it was literally a chemical weapon that they knew would the, the devastate rural areas, not only at that time, but for many generations. Uh, today, the third and fourth generations of Vietnamese are still affected by Agent Orange, as well as our veterans. Uh, the government denied that there was any health effects. The corporations denied that there was health effects. And internal documents that have been released have shown that the government and the corporations knew for decades the health effects that these products were causing on our veterans and our, 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 our uh, the, the Vietnamese. Uh, by the way, in Vietnam, we did the same thing with cluster bombs. We knew that these cluster bombs were going to uh, implode for many decades into the future, affecting children playing in the gr grounds, affecting peasants and farmers. Uh, so they were long-term uh, bombs that were used, just like we're using uh, depleted uranium today in uh, Iraq, Afghanistan, and in other countries. Uh, 
so, sorry for keep going. The, the, these chemicals, sometimes it takes decades, but eventually they may be they, they may be removed. The problem the problem with genetically modified crops is that those are living forms, and those will be a lot harder. So once a gene escapes into the wild, into the native corn, into the native papaya, uh, it may be imprinted into the genetic information of that plant perpetually, so it might not be possible to get rid of it. Thank you, Hector. Can we give Hector uh, another round? <laughs> Thank you so much for that. Um, Hector, I'm, Dr. Hector Venezuela is part of, uh, I think he uh, labeled it Hawaii. Uh, he also he does a lot of panel discussion um, events and stuff. He's actually a professor too at CCAR. So, okay. um, ne up next, I have just an intermission. I have Karina Vegas. She is a family that um, we recently supported and worked with on a project of, of her own. So she's here to um, share her story. So, Karina. Oh. Aloha, thank you again for hello for the opportunity to uh, be here. Um, I love Occupy Honolulu and what they're doing to um, support all these causes um, to help us, uh, the ordinary person. Um, my story is my family. Um, we own a a home, it's paid off, and it's on Bishop cool. Estate lease land in Punalu. And for five years, uh, we had struggled with the uh, devastations of the flooding caused by Bishop Estate and also other land management issues. And uh, so after exhausting um, all avenues with Bishop Estate, I was ready to take my story to the people. Um, to take my case to the people because I firmly believe that um, uh, nothing that Bishop Estate is um, um, <clears throat> telling me or taking me to court, we've been in court um, trying to do, um, to settle, um, but all they're interested in is if you don't like it, you leave or they said that they'll build a house for my family and then we rent to them. And we said, no, my house is paid off and uh, you need to correct the wrongs. So, to cut a long story short, on Monday morning, um, we met with the CEO of Bishop Estate, and it was a historical moment because um, I had uh, told them that I'm doing my press conference on Thursday, and I was going to a rally at the state capitol. I will march down Punch Bowl and to Queen Street, and Occupy Honolulu will support my family. We were going to occupy their office. And we also did a film that Occupy Honolulu had helped us put together a documentary. And so within, not even within an hour, you know, they called. And uh, so within the two days of phone calls, they wanted to meet with us Monday morning. And so at that meeting, they only gave me one hour. and. I gave it to them and I said I'm walking out this door and this is what I'm going to do and I'm not going to stop telling the world my story about ending landlord injustices and saving my home. Huh? So that one hour meeting they said uh, okay we'll call our legal team and uh, we're not going to put a eviction notice on your home and so you can feel at ease that we're not going to evict you from your home. But, <laughs> so uh, I think the moral of the story is that um, here's a huge corporation, the largest landowner in Hawaii, uh, the richest in the country and one of the richest in the world, and they have all the means to manipulate the law and get the largest legal team in the world, which they told me. And I was going to lose or bankrupt my attorney. And I told them, I don't care if you have all the money in the world. I will tell my story to the world. And it's about ending landlord injustices. So I made a big sign. And I encourage everyone. Um, the sign is, we the people, by the people, for the people are the people. So, speak out Hawaii. 
So I encourage all of you to speak up because if one family can do it, then all the families can do it. So um, I still have my, um, I have a petition that is online right now. Uh, it's uh, two websites, Bishop Estate Landlord and Justice.com, and one is uh, on change.org. So I invite you to come up and make your voices heard. I have my laptop here. Uh, please come and sign, submit a comment, and every voice counts because it's the petitions here that I had online that they found out and they saw the people's comments and it got to them. And also because they, they couldn't um, manipulate my family or scare my family because right is right and wrong is wrong. And I don't need any money to fight them. All I need is the conviction of the wrong has been done and speak out and then people like Occupy Honolulu to come forward and, and support. So um, I urge everyone, <coughs> uh, please continue to uh, support the activities that Occupy Honolulu is doing. I think it's an awesome platform, it's an awesome movement, and I think this is where our voices um, are heard loud and clear. Um, I heard the Dr. Venezuela speak on the GMO um, and I have a really strong feeling about Bishop Estate being involved in it. And I did tell them, I'm a Kamehameha Schools parent, and as a Kamehameha Schools parent, I will not tolerate any of the injustices that they do. Um, so if they are involved with GMO, um, Occupy Honolulu, <laughs> I will speak out and I'll make sure that nobody buys those GMO because as a doctor's daughter, my mom is a, also a registered nurse, I grew up on, um, on fresh foods, fresh foods, freshly growing. Um, my dad never ate any frozen foods his whole life and as a doctor he worked for more than 53 years in his profession and not one day sick because of his diet in um, eating fresh foods. So I can speak for it uh, firsthand. <laughs> okay, so no GMOs, but thank you to Midori and thank you to everyone. God bless everyone. Aloha. Sorry to cut you off. I know your story is really compelling, but uh, yeah, it can wait. <laughs> Just kidding. Um, so up next, we have Dr. Keone Dudley. Please give him a round of applause. Um, he was one of the... Uh, please, that can start now. <laughs> that he... Uh, mic check, okay. He was one of the petitioners um, uh, against the whole plea development project. Um, and I actually, that's actually where I met him. So thank you, Keone, for being here. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I'll just talk to you a short while because uh, the sun is going down. It's going to get dark here pretty soon, and I know there are other people that are uh, anxious to get up here and talk to. But I do want to talk to you about uh, Ho'opiti. And uh, first of all, in case you're not aware of Ho'opiti is, Ho'opiti is out in the country uh, beyond Waipahu. When you get to Waipahu on the freeway, as soon as you get to Punia Road, which is the end of Waipahu, you come out into the great big wide open space, and that is Ho'opiti on your left-hand side, all the way to Kapolei. Uh, how big is it? It's um, 1,525 acres. That's, that's a lot of land. It's about uh, two miles along and about two miles that way, and uh, it's all beautiful, beautiful uh, farmland. That, that farmland, uh, D.R. Horton has bought. They bought it in 2006, and they would like to buy. Uh, they would, they would like to build 12,000 houses on it. Now, do we need those houses? Uh, let's first of all start with that question. The answer is absolutely not. But we've already got 50,000 houses already approved by the Land Use Commission, already fully zoned and fully entitled out in that area. 50,000 houses. Now, the, the city itself says that over the next, until 2035, we're going to need 46,000 houses, 46,800 houses. Well, we've already got 
50,000 zones. You know, do we need this extra 12,000 houses? The answer is just simply no. We don't need those houses at all. Do we need it for jobs? Well, for crying out loud, if we got 50,000 houses already zoned and already ready to build, why aren't we building them? It's because of the economy. It's not for lack of houses, you know? So, so we don't need the 12 more houses in order to create jobs because we already have the 50,000 houses out there waiting to be built, right? <laughs> so no, we, we, we don't need it for how We don't need it for jobs. We don't need it for houses, you know? What do we need it for? We need it for D.R. Horton, America's largest home builder, which is not a local company. It is a Texas-based company. We need them to make billions and billions of bucks. And why do we need them to make billions and billions of bucks? Because politicians need to be thanked for the favors that have been done for them. That's why. Now, I don't mean to say the Land Use Commission. I, th I think, personally, the Land Use Commission is a very honest group. I'll tell you, I don't think that anybody, you know, you know we just had the big decisions, huh? The big, big decision against Coral Ridge and the big decision against uh, Holt Peely. I don't think for one second that anybody on the Land Use Commission was approached by D.R. Horton. I don't think that they got any money from them. I don't think that they are, uh, I don't think they're dishonest. I think they're really honest folks. It's just they were the wrong folks to get on the Land Use Commission. You know, every one of them has something to do with construction or the unions. And, you know, it, who's going to profit from building things? Construction and the unions. So what are they on there for if the whole purpose of the Land Use Commission is to keep the land in farming? Okay. So we got some basic problems in of our government, and a lot of people have been speaking about government up here. I'm just, it's a wonderful afternoon. <laughs> All right, our government is just simply that's the people who are being bought, huh? And and uh, and you know, Abercrombie met with us before he was elected. We took a large group from Save Oahu Farmlands. I don't know if you've noticed my shirt, Save Oahu Farm. I, I have these for sale up here, by the way, really cheap. Um, if uh, we met with Abercrombie before the election, he says, you know, Keone, there's no chance they're ever going to build that uh, the prop property. That's going to be farmland forever. And there's no chance that rail is going to come down there because, you know, I just won't let it happen. Well, it wasn't very many weeks later when he was already elected, and uh, now he was beholden to these folks that he changed his story. So then he starts putting people on the Land Use Commission, like every other governor has, who are going to go for the construction. All right, well, let's get back and talk a little bit about this land. Um, and, and before we get back to the land, let, let me just throw in a little aside here, okay? I just want to pay tribute for one minute, since this is supposed to be a sustainability workshop. Uh, pay a, a, a tribute to the, the father of sustainability, who was on, on this island, and, and in Hawaii, was uh, Ira Roeder. Ira Roeder, years ago, back in 1994, wrote a book called A Green Hawaii. And uh, we, we need to be aware of that, because that was the first book on sustainability written. Um, and then he founded the Green Party. And I actually ran for governor in 1994 as a Green Party candidate. Now, the reason we're bringing all that up is the government, again, the House of Representatives is uh, run by the Speaker of the House, whose name is Calvin Say. And Calvin Say, as a representative, is running for office again. And there's somebody running against him in the primary, and then there's somebody running against him in the general. The person in the primary, his name is Simon, he's a nice guy, and I, I, I hope he wins. But if he doesn't, in the general, there's going to be a green running, and that's going to be Keiko Bonk. Some people know Keiko Bonk. Okay, she's back. She's back from the Big Island, and she's running for the House of Representatives. And we need to get behind Keiko, folks, so I just need to tell you that. Okay, let me move on and continue on about farms. What is there about this farmland? The farm, you know, we, we, we tend to think that farmland that gets a lot of rain is going to grow a lot of crops. And that, that's something that we just kind of grow up with, huh? A lot of rain because you need water to grow crops. What you need to grow crops, though, is not rain and overcast skies, but rather sunshine. Now, the good thing about this property is, where is it? It's down in the lowlands where all the sunshine is. So how many crops can you get there a year? Well, 
We say it's the highest producing farmland in the world. Why do we say that? Because you can't grow crops year-round in most places. They get one crop uh, per year on the mainland huh? because of their winters. Here we can grow crops all year round, and what our limitations are is the overcast skies. So, how many crops can you grow in Hawaii? Well, in Waimanalo, you can get two crops a year because they get a lot of rain in Waimanalo. On the north slopes, uh, below Wahiawa and above uh, Haleiwa, you can get three crops a year. But it's Hopili, you can get four crops a year. Now. It's, it's it's fantastic land, huh? They have fantastic water and lots and lots of good fresh water. It's also got the right pH levels. Uh, that's the acidity and alkaline in the, in, the, in, the, in the soil. It's perfect for the crops that it grows there. And uh, and then what other kinds of things does it have? Because it's in a lowlands, you don't get the rot, you don't get the mildew, you get a lot less bugs in the, in the lowland. And and in, in general, you know, it's it's the best land around. It was called the Golden Triangle. Now, there's only uh, the one-fourth of the Golden Triangle is left. Everything else is built on. And where is that one-fourth of the Golden Triangle? It's Ho'opili. Okay. So, you know, we're taking the best land that we've got. We've, we've, it, it, it's all mollusols and vertisols, and I don't know what those things are, except I know that Professor Jonathan Phoenix, Jonathan Phoenix testified that they are the two best quality soils in the world, okay? thousand acres of that is mollusols and vertisols. It's also a clay, and, and the clay has a problem. The clay expands and contracts when it's wet, right? Okay, and that, if you put a house foundation on top, is going to expand and contract and break the house foundation. So how do you solve a problem like that? Well, D.R. Horton will come in for the thousand acres that we're talking about, and they will scrape off four feet of our best soil in the world, and they will bring in four feet of coral and put it there. Why? For the house foundation. Now, folks, what we're doing is we're allowing them to take the best farmland in the world and to haul it away and, and, and put it in junk places, you know, and, and, and some of it even goes up to the dump. And, and, and instead, they're going to bring in coral, and, and then they're going to put a little layer of, of, uh, of uh, dirt on top of that and make an Oreo sandwich. Now, Jonathan Dienick says that if we let the world just take care of itself, as long as humankind lives on this earth, that land will not revive. It, it, it won't, that there won't be enough dirt come and intermix with the coral so as to revive itself. Okay? Are we really going to allow that? <laughs> well, I like that answer. Okay. Good. And why aren't we going to allow it? Well, because of a couple of reasons. One is, how much food do we have on this island? Three days. One week, two weeks, two, one and a half weeks, less than two weeks of food on the island right now. What happens if the boats stop coming? Military escape. Yeah, we're going to die. Evacuation plan. We're going to die. Okay. <laughs> how much of our food do we import? If, I mean, if we're so dependent on the boats, how much do we import? We import 90% of our food, okay? Why aren't we going to allow them to take that best land and, and haul them away? It's because we import 90% of our food and we only have two weeks supply on the island and we need land to grow crops on. Now, when they took Ho'opili and Koa Ridge, they took 45% of the land on Oahu that is currently growing crops for food here. I'm not talking about export pineapple and flowers and stuff like that. I'm talking about the, the land on Oahu growing food for local people. They took 45% two weeks ago. We can't allow that to happen. You know, we just can't allow that to happen. Let's, let's take a look at what could happen with that place. And, and, uh, and just think for a minute, okay? If, if, if the farmer there, Aloon Farms, would continue moving out, and they're, they're supposed to be moving out because of the development, huh? That would free up a lot of that land. Now, where, where is the land? It's right 
across the road from UH West Oahu. What's happening at UH West Oahu? Well, they're this, they're opening up this fall, huh? And did you know that Ma'o Farms is opening up with them, and that they're starting an agriculture program there? And did you know that there are 75 students a year going to be in that program? And did you know that those students who come out are going to need land? And did you know that there is no land available? You know, nobody, farmers can't find land. Here is 1,400 acres that is slowly going to be opened up as a loon farms moves out. And we could put those farmers there and we could double the production there right now. Is that something that's desirable? Yeah. <laughs> I sure think so. Okay, I, I want to get uh, uh, get finished up here and let other people talk. So let me just say to you that, oh, uh, there's one more thing I do want to talk about. I want, I want to talk to you about the, the Land Use Commission and what's happening. Uh, they're, they're going to meet again tomorrow morning. Uh, it's 9 o'clock. It's at the State Office Tower, uh, which is across from St. Andrew's Cathedral. And uh, they're going to decide at that time, they're going to confirm their vote from last week. We've got some people coming that I think are going to be pretty impressive, and they're going to try to talk them out of doing that, but most likely they'll go ahead and vote, and most likely we'll lose again. On the, in that case, we are going to appeal, and the first step is to make a motion for reconsideration, and then the second step is, uh, if we fail there, to take them to court. Let me tell you that the laws are all on our side. You know, the fact, that, the fact that the Land Use Commission voted against this is because it's all the wrong people in the Land Use Commission doing yes. what they're supposed to do, which is yeah. protect their own people, their construction people and their uh, unions. You know? But uh, we, uh, we are going to take them to court, and we're going to win because the law is really on our side. I think I'll wrap it there. Um, I really appreciate the opportunity to talk to you. I know that you're looking for other people to come up and talk. I'm sure they're anxious to get up here, and so let me just finish up. Yes. Okay, what can you do in the meantime? I think um, you can write the Land Use Commission. Uh, and and uh, you could show up for the hearing tomorrow if you wanted to and testify. I think that uh, the basic thing is, though, so, uh, write a letter to the editor. Right? Uh, you know, that's where the media is going to count because, you know, the, the newspapers are going to continue. To, 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 they'll put in anything we send, practically, you know. Uh, and then the other thing is write op-ed articles. I don't know if you noticed this morning, there was a tremendous op-ed article in the paper um, written by Adam Bensley uh, about the Land Use Commission itself. And uh, I, I think that, you know, we need more of those kind of things. Okay, and uh, then the other thing you can do is look at our website, which is ta-da, save Oahu farmlands, okay, dot org. And uh, you'll find all kinds of suggestions there of things that you can do. Since I work during the day, I can't come down to the hearings, but uh, um, a lot, I think a lot of people are in that same situation. But I think um, looking at the, the last hearing, there were a lot of the union shirts, the orange shirts there. And it would be nice to see like a lot of green, go green shirts there. Um, um, I was wondering if it would be good to like if people wanted to sponsor some shirts there, and so that when people show up, maybe they might choose to wear it. And so that might be a good idea to to get more green shirts actually. There. All right, good. So she's suggesting anybody who wants to make a contribution and sponsor some shirts so that we can give them away, that'd be good. But let me tell you that I do have some of these shirts up here right now, though, and I'll be sitting around here, and anybody who is interested in them, uh, they, they, uh, they cost us $9.10 to produce. So, uh, you know, we're, we're not anxious to sell them at a price less than that. So, so we're selling them at 10 
uh, which makes us a prophet of, well, never mind. <laughs> okay, and um, in actuality, if you don't have ten and you're really, really going to wear the shirt, we'll give it to you for five, okay? So I'll be sitting over here. Another one for Dr. Keone Dudley. You should see him in action at the Lenius Commission. It's pretty intense. Not like us, but... Uh, <laughs> so, um, uh, well, up next we have... <laughs> is it too well? <laughs> How do we turn it off? <laughs> is it because I'm talking too loud? Was I talking? Okay. Okay. <laughs> um, I'm pulling this. Oh, it makes sense now. I can get a round of applause for that. Oh. I'm a natural. Um, up next, I have. Did you give me one of those shirts and after all? After this. Um, Jeff Scott from West Pacific Seeds, West Pacific Seeds, um, please come up. Thank you again, please, please. Dr. Yeah. Jeff Scott. Hello, hello, thank you. Um, I have to tell you, I'm a recent immigrant to Hawaii. I came here a year ago for the purpose of breeding vegetable crops and creating new varieties of vegetables that grow better in Hawaii. Uh, the company that I work for has about two employees, um, so we're not too big. I'm the research department. Um, most of the time I'm covered in red dirt and mud, and I, I cleaned up to come down here. Um, so. My time in Hawaii has been really interesting so far because of all of these issues. Um, and I don't know all of this long history and politics and all of that. Um, but I have worked in agriculture all of my life. I started my career as an organic gardener and then got a degree in horticulture uh, a, a graduate degree in vegetable crops production and a PhD in genetics and have worked as, as a plant breeder and um, also a little while in uh, uh, plant protection. The company that I work for has been selling seeds out here for about 15 years to commercial farmers on the islands and in other places. Um, but we don't produce any organic seeds. It's really focusing on the traditional farmers and, and such to create better varieties. Part of the issues here, of course, are that there's a lot of disease issues um, that can't be dealt with with any kind of pesticide spray, such as viruses and things. Oh, I guess it's cooperative. Um, anyway. So I, I was asked to talk some about sustainability, and of course, living on an island, we're very aware of that issue because it's in front of us all the time. And this, this issue of having only two weeks worth of food is really important. <laughs> There's a, a couple of things, of course, that we can do is, is to have some emergency rations stashed away. And I lived in Florida for a while when the hurricanes come in and. And it was routine for people to have emergency supplies set up because you never know if you're going to get hit and have no access to food, water, or power for several weeks. Um, so for an emergency thing, you know, that's something we can do. The big issue with the food production is that we can grow some food here. There's a lot of things that will grow here. Uh, I have learned that the insects and diseases here are absolutely ferocious, just ferocious. <laughs> and I admire a very difficult time controlling the population. Um, the issues on an island like this are really no different than the issues 
that everybody on the mainland is also going to face. Not so much right now, but in the future. Because all of these issues about sustainability, about productivity, uh, about pollution, about global warming, all of these really come down to issues of population increase because human populations have grown enormously over the past especially 200 years. And in the 1800s, there was only one billion people on the planet Earth. This year, we hit seven billion, and it, it's not going to go down. And so this magnifies all of the issues, um, you know, from water use and availability to growing our foods, and how do we do that, and where do we live, and how do we move from one place to another and whether we're going to use cars and oil and all of these things. And so uh, during the next generation, we're going to see huge changes as people try to find solutions to this, these, these issues. We know that on an island like this, we can grow more food than we are. And really, part of the issue comes down to economics because it's very difficult to grow food here cheaper than it can be imported. And so the price of oil has been a major factor. When there were dairies and cattle production here on the islands, those, those farms mostly closed because they could not compete with the cost of materials being shipped over from the mainland uh, with the, during the time of cheap oil. Now as the oil prices go up, the equation changes, and so now people are, are rethinking this and trying to think, well, what can we do? And for some things it will make sense, and for some products it, it won't make sense. Um, the islands are not big enough to grow enough feed for beef cattle to feed everybody on the islands. There's just not enough room, there's not enough water. And so that's not going to make sense. Um, so, you know, we need to look for alternative sources of protein or decide, you know, what beef's going to just be imported um, and, and pay the prices. For some of the fresh vegetables and things, there's a lot that can be grown here. Um, they don't require as much space as growing feed for animals. Um, some of the farmers, of course, are growing tomatoes, peppers, watermelons, onions, and things like that. Um, but these are mostly not the food staples, not like the wheat, rice, and, and things that are, the, are stable carbohydrates. Um, we do have a little bit of taro production still up by uh, Wailua, where I live. Um, but most of the people on the island are not depending on that anymore. There is potential to grow a lot more, but it, whether we do or not, depends mostly on economics. Um, it, it is difficult for far, small farmers to get access to land. If, if you have enough money to buy 150 acres or 200 acres, then it's, easy, it's possible to buy land. Um, I don't even know what the prices are, but I'm sure it's high. Um, but for for Small farmers trying to get five acres is, is, or ten acres, it's really difficult. Um, so that, that's an issue. I had a, a meeting last week with the uh, Commissioner of Agriculture, and, and he says he's, that he's dedicated to uh, helping farmers, small farmers getting started with loan programs and, and things like that. There's some discussion about possibilities for get, making some of the state lands available for small farmers and things like that. And we hope that those developments will come into being. No, right now, they're not there. I know that I have heard um, a lot of discussion about GMO crops. Um, I'm a geneticist. I've never actually worked with any GMO crops. I've never worked with any of the... Um, companies that develop them, um, but I do understand the technology, I understand what's going on, I understand the chemistry. 
And I can tell you that there is an enormous amount of incorrect information that is floating around. There's a lot of fear because people don't understand the chemistry. And a lot of things that um, people express fears about are things that, in terms of the biology, are really not anything that's a big deal. As an example, I, I would like to mention that the Bt corn, um, Bt refers to Bacillus thuringiensis, it's a natural bacteria, and Bt has been used by organic farmers to control caterpillars for many decades, and it's normally uh, mixed as a powder and sprayed on the plants, and when the young caterpillars um, eat this material, uh, there's a protein in the bacteria that disrupts the digestive tract of the um, caterpillars and it kills them. And, and it's, it's mainly a protein that causes that. And the Bt corn is simply a corn that has the gene inserted that makes that one protein. So that when the caterpillars land, or the moths land on the corn and lay the eggs, when the eggs hatch and the tiny insect begins to feed, it's eating some of that protein and then dies. Where I lived in Florida, there was a lot of sweet corn produced in the winter. And by spraying the Bt on the corn, it would wash off every time it rained so that the corn had to be sprayed aerially every day. And with the GMO corn, it doesn't wash off. The protein is on the inside instead of the outside. And the caterpillars die and they don't have to spray. It, this particular protein has been proven to be safe for human consumption for more than four decades. It's been used by organic farmers for four decades. The, the chemistry is known what gene was inserted and what product it makes. And we know that that protein has been proven safe for human consumption. It's one of the safest things that, that has been used for any insect control. And that's why one of the reasons it was selected for that, for making that GMO. Um, you know, so I understand that people always want to ask questions, all right? But, you know, the reality is it, it's been used for a long, long time, and we know that there have not been health issues. Have questions? Are we not eating at higher prices? What is sprayed on? First of all, break down, break down sunlight. Also, the question was that if if the plant is producing the protein does that mean that we're eating larger quantities of that and I will say the information is available and I'm I'm not aware of exactly what those concentrations are. Certainly before the EPA uh, allowed and FDA allowed um, production of this, those questions were asked and answered by the, by the people who uh, were involved in the regulation.
Yeah, just a question over here. I'm originally from the Midwest. Yeah, I, I lived in Michigan. It's really cold. You know, I, I grew up dreaming of surfing. And finally, I get to come here. I explained it all. Well, it's a good thing. Let people hear both sides. I know. Agent Orange, the herbicide, yeah. yeah. I would say... I have not researched that specifically, but I... After he speaks, when you introduce that guy, mention that you wanted people to hear what happened. So people have a better understanding. Can you let him know that all these questions should be towards me, because that's what I'm talking about, as well as the... No, I was not speaking about Agent Orange. I was speaking about BT corn. I'm talking about all my the agent agent orange is an herbicide, is, uh, and when uh, when that was used in Vietnam, there was GMO, a contaminant so called the dioxin that was present during the manufacturing process, what is, uh, and it was the dioxin that has caused actually all going the on. problems. And as you can see, and those were not anticipated. Our group that is was in obviously a huge mistake, and, uh, and our, many people our, in our group are asking questions. So really what exactly is going on? Because Nobody here really supports GMO, for the world by their but in, in the argument that allows uh, uh, questions and uh, a view of both sides, you know, we can only uh, rightfully have both sides here. I was so, not aware of that. That's interesting to, to learn about. I really like how the, the group is engaging. Um, I'd, I'd be happy to talk to you about the history of the park. Is that to the sustainability, or can we talk about it in a minute? <laughs> we, can we come back to that? Are you catching this? Another question. The, the question was, how, as a geneticist, you know, what's my opinion about GMO crops interbreeding with other, other crops? The, the choice of materials use of crops... <laughs> Hello? Here we are. A number of people have... What's going on? All right. Do I have a loose wire somewhere? <laughs> At least up here. Um, in in Hawaii, the main GMO crop that's grown is corn. All right. The corn producers maintain isolation so that they don't act cross-pollinate with their other corn or with their competitors. Um, there is, I'm not aware of other people producing commercial corn here, um, but corn pollen is wind pollinated, so if someone is upwind, normally there's not going to be an issue. Um, with some crops, uh, such as soybeans, they self-pollinate Cross-pollination is not an issue. Um, in, in general, for uh, some of the other crops, like people um, that's being sued for uh, rape, there was con in their concern fields. for cross-pollination in wow. Europe, and I, I don't know about. what the status of that is, whether that it's, has proved to be a problem. Question. I'm waiting here. Thank you, guys.
What the heck? <laughs> this is not. This is just a much about that, right? Uh, uh, yeah, I think so. Well, I don't think it's like Monsanto, who's, you know, himself guy. I think it's someone that supports. Uh, sir, how many are, how many acres do you farm? How many acres do you farm? Yes. <laughs> Well, you know, that's, that's great. Well, yeah, and, and in some cases it has to be applied every day, and that adds to cost. You should ask that question of the farmers. You should ask that question of the farmers because they're the people who are asking for these products. These are the people who buy these products, preferably over something else. Because they're happy because in the way that it works. Well, there is a, another question in addition to how much work it is. It's a question of reliability. And farming is a very risky business. And steps that can be made economically to reduce that risk are things that farmers pay a lot of attention to. But then it increases the risk to people's health. And so you need to look at people's health versus, you know, making it very available so that you increase the profit. So you have to look at and weigh it. The people's lives are more important over the profit. So maybe the farmers don't even know about it, okay? Like the common citizen, they don't even know how much uh, detrimental that is if you put this inside the corn, you know, for all these years and it's not being labeled. Who knows what is inside us and get inside the bloodstream and causing a lot of these foreign diseases, okay? So that's the question. Always think of the person's health, the risk to the, the person's health. We, we agree that our health is most important for all of us. And the people who work in the EPA and the FDA likewise believe that people's health is important. And, well, you may choose to believe or not believe, but I have worked with scientists and I understand their integrity. And, you know, there's a lot of people doing a lot of hard work to create food for everybody here. And it's food that is safe to eat and you're really not being poisoned. You're really not. Well, that's what I was just going to get at. The, the farmers the farmers are not permitted to save uh, and replant seed that has been patented. Okay, now that's not the scientists that are deciding that. No, 
don't no, have those are the attorneys. I don't have a problem. <laughs> those are attorneys. That's where the problem is. Well, now, has to have a we problem have a lot of problems that and you know can be blamed on attorneys and, and, and people, I'm attorneys who work in legislatures. Again, profits well, over the health <laughs> and the livelihood of people. The reason why I bring up that part of it is because of what you said earlier about farmers want to do what's best for themselves. Okay, short term, they're going to say, hey, I don't have to spray the BT as often. I don't have to fight the, 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 the caterpillars and the, the, you know, whatever is going on. But long term, is it really helping them or hurting them? My understanding is that in India, where they grow a lot of cotton, where they have switched to genetically modified, where they cannot save the seeds, where they could not replant that kind of stuff, um, that yes, they can use less water, yes, they save money up front, yes, suicides are an all-time high, failures are an all-time high. But hey, short term, maybe <laughs> it is beneficial, but long term, are there consequences? I'm not saying it's because of scientists, but remember, the scientists, all they are doing is they're making it happen. It's someone else who's saying, hey, let's go one step further and let's, you know, Get hold of all so as long as perhaps if we had a little bit more of the scientists, they could have a little more say over what the lawyers be told to do. But it, it, I guess I'm a little bit concerned when I mean, greed is the number one factor. Um, the guys at the top are going to tell the law, lawyers, you need to do it this way, and they're going to screw things up. In the meantime, the scientists are over here, and they're doing their thing, and they're doing their Sometimes they are. I mean, look at the ring spot virus on the papaya. They say the papaya, Hawaii, and so on. Okay, sometimes they're similar. Sometimes they're not. It's Where do you draw the line? Again, it comes to health, the risk to the people, versus making the profit. You know, we have the best government money can buy. <laughs> I mean, I, I would be willing to bet that there is, not everything, but there is something that is slipping the FDA because the right columns were green. So, I, I, I'm not, I'm not 100% against the well. You know, un unfortunately, I cannot speak for the integrity of bureaucrats. Okay, that's, that's where my concern is because you can't just look at the science side and, and just look forget at about the look social at the issue, picture. the ramification, what the company is doing. I'm not, I'm not going to beat up on the scientists. The scientists are looking at the right. BT works great. We've used it for many, many years. I would like to see it continue. It qualifies. It's got the little hungry, thicker thing on it. This is the right thing. It's organic. It comes from the soil. It's perfectly normal. It's evolved. It's very natural. Scientists look at that and they do it. Maybe it works. But what you just said with the companies do, remember, you can't save a percentage of your, your ears of corn and seed crop for the next go round. Farmer, farmers don't. Say, none of the farmers save seed because commercial corn is all hybrid. And saving seed, it wouldn't breed true anyway. And you have to share, sir. A lot of other people would like to do this. Okay, it's not being recorded. But in other words, you know, if you have something to say, let the rest of the people so they can understand. Please. No, don't be ashamed. Please step up. Yeah. You see, this so is where it starts, okay? You gotta talk to the you gotta talk to the right. I just want to remind everyone, um, as a part of the uh, organization of this panel discussion, this conference, whichever you want to call it, I, I invited these speakers um, to speak, you know, as, as um, their form of expertise, um, the fields that they specialize in. And basically, this is a little piece of who they are. Um, I chose uh, some of these speakers because I knew that they had, you know, egg, egg, op, op, opposing um, um, fields and, and uh, opinions and perspectives. So I also, so in doing that, I wanted to create a, a really diverse dialogue, something that's a little bit different from a panel discussion and a conference that I've, that I've always been to. Whereas 
the, the topic is, it could be anything. It could be sustainability. And they're all, like, organic farmers. They're all, like, you know, or, or, uh, scientists and whatever. But they're all on the same side. And I never got to experience a panel discussion where some people were all, all on different sides. Not, not, not so much that completely did it to the end of the spectrum. In some case, there is. But the idea behind what I did today is to, is to open, open that dialogue between people who don't, um, who don't share the same perspective, who, are, who aren't like-minded, and for us to kind of listen to each other and look at how we interact with each other when we don't like what, what uh, another person has to say when they are just another person. So just remind ourselves a little bit about where we're coming from and what we're here for as individuals, as, as males, as females, as revolutionaries, as activists, but mostly um, um, as a family. So please mind your manao. I can't answer that. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. you know, really, all of us want a better world. You know, it, it's way too easy for all of us to point the finger at problems <coughs> and issues and concerns. All of us want a better life for our children, our grandchildren. And, you know, somehow we've got to find ways to work together to make make all of this world a better place. I like that. What about, you know, he was bringing up about the seeds, and uh, here, like earlier, we found out we have days worth of food supply here on this island. Now, since we're not able to use the seeds, what happens when the boats stop coming to bring more seeds, food, and all the stuff that we need for uh, us to keep producing some form of food here on the island so we don't become cannibals like someone said that you know earlier well I, yeah you know are the boats going to stop uh yeah there's there's, there's various reasons why the to stop. We're, we are the most secluded spot in the world for a reason because we're surrounded by water not everybody's able to take a kayak like uh uh what is it uh google maps likes to say across the ocean to get here so you know with that if uh we have a major catastrophe between Big Island, uh, say something breaks off, or an earthquake, a volcano, a tsunami, uh, many, many different things that could happen that would cause the boats to stop coming. What do we do when we look at our crops for food and we can't plant no more seed or produce the crops because we relied on Monsanto? Well, if, if, if there's a natural disaster, the boats could stop the boats or a war or something, it would take too long to grow any crops to keep people. All right? So, in, in a certain sense, you know, that's you know, almost a moot point if you're having to wait for crops to grow. Well, if we have to wait to even plant the crops, we're even worse conditioned than trying to plant the crops themselves, correct? Well, as, you know, <laughs> The reason why I ask is because other nations have been crippled by the fact that they can't replant the crops and they're going bankrupt by buying the seeds. So if, they're, if, they've, if they've destroyed their economy and their crop stance on a crop that they can't reproduce on their own, how are those, just like they've seen, they can't feed themselves anymore and utilize those crops, how is a nation that's able to sit there and... Uh, even attempt to sustain themselves if they're in the same predicament because of a natural disaster. What country are you talking about? Uh, you're standing in one. Well... <laughs> if, if we had to immediately start growing all of the food here for everyone who lives here now, we couldn't do it. Well, I'm saying there is land, there are some tractors, but if the boats stop coming, the oil stops coming. And and without the oil, you're, you're not running the tractors either. You, you are familiar with the peak oil film that was just being shown over this last weekend, and Roberto Perez Rivero, who is here from Cuba. Cuba is now the only country that is 
Thank you. Um, I'm Henry Curtis. I got my start in the environmental movement. We're going to hold up because of the sirens. It's a normal Occupy thing. Sirens every day. All day. They love sirens I'm here. I'm Henry Curtis. Um, I got my start in the environmental movement going door to door in California in the 1980s. My chief I issue that I worked on was pesticides. I know, for example, that methyl isocyanate, MIC, was what leaked at Bhopal, India, the worst disaster for pesticides in the world history. That is a precursor to making aldicar, a pesticide sprayed in granular form on soil that is sucked down, brought up into the roots, inside potatoes, so when bugs land on them and drink them, they peel over dead. With dirty dozen pesticides. I also worked on changing the laws in this state because this state says if you try to use genetically engineered techniques in your living room with the windows open and you attempt to make a bubonic plague, that is legal. I repeat, it's legal. It's illegal to ship it in from California to here, but it's legal to try to splice it in your living room with the windows open. And I was told at, at the legislature, the reason we can't legislate any restrictions like that is because if you put a single restriction on genetic engineering, that's a slippery slope, and soon you'll want to regulate the industry. And therefore, it's better not to have any regulations, whatever, because after all, what can possibly go wrong? We've seen the meltdown at Wall Street. Could that happen with our crops? Who knows? Who cares? That was the opinion of the legislature. As to whether we can grow our own crops here, during the American Civil War, we grew potatoes, we grew wheat, we sold it to California because they were cut off from others. What's preventing us from becoming sustainable here is that the land, agricultural land, is cheap. Developers know if they claim they can't grow anything on it, then they can turn it into a tourism or residential development. They're allowed to put gentlemen estates up with housing and not use ag land for agriculture. And 85% of the dollar value of all crops produced in this state, 85% is exported. We are growing the wrong crops. And the number one crop that we're growing that's wrong are seeds, which are being exported. Can we have a rebuttal? Can we hear the rebuttal on that? Yeah. yeah do you have a rebuttal for that? Um, this is a talk and not a debate, just so everyone knows. Discussion is at the end. So can Dr. Scott finish? Is that okay with everybody? Yeah. Is everyone okay with letting other people speak? Well, we, I we think it would be just as well to start your discussion now. You yeah. want to start it now? Yeah, why not? Go team, let's do it. Okay. <laughs> so uh, let's set, let's get set up so and everyone can just mingle around for a few minutes. Oh yeah, Henry Curtis. Holy shit. Oh. <laughs> um. Here at Occupy, we believe in free speech. It's cool. <laughs> Hi, I'm Henry Curtis. I'm back again. I was going to talk about energy. And anybody here have an extra half billion dollars? Yeah, I got bailed out. Lanai has just been sold. The what? Lanai, the island of Lanai has just been sold. Half a billion dollars. The third wealthiest person in the world has bought it. He has $36 billion. So a half a billion is not much for him. So that's the, what, the top one-tenth of one-tenth of one-hundredth, one-thousandth percent, number three in the world. Um, 
I'm talking about energies, yes. Um, and I thought since we're talking about energy and sustainability, the curious thing is that the Hawaiians had no word for sustainability. Okay. If you go to the Hawaiian dictionary and you put in the word sustainability, you get zero hits. They knew what it was. They lived within their means. We had a million people here. They had enough food to live on. We now have a million people, and we import 90%. There's something wrong. And yet, if you look at what sustainability is on the web, you just put in sustainability, you get 125 million hits. Um, and, and it's curious what you get, because you get sustainable growth. Doesn't work, but... Um, sustainable is really a buzzword. I don't like it. I don't like green. I don't like renewable. I don't like sustainable. I don't like clean. I don't like smart. They've all been corrupted. So when I talk about energy, I like low climate impact, low environmental impact, low cultural impact, relatively cheap energy from here. And that's pretty hard to screw up. I read recent, recently there has been a lot of talk by the American Wind Energy Association about how they want to renew the federal production tax credit to sort of subsidize big wind so we can have more large industrial size uh, wind farms. And so I, today I just went to the web and decided to look up the board members of the American Wind Energy Association to figure out who is sitting on the National Wind Board that wants all these windmills. And there are 29 people. There's one person from BP. There's one person from GE. You know, the guys who put PCBs in the Hudson River for three decades? and then complain for 25 years that they would actually have to be responsible for it. There are five companies that are involved in nuclear energy. Exelon has one-fifth of the nuclear capacity in the United States, and they sit on the American Wind Energy Association board. There are actually seven wind companies out of the 29 board members. Because wind energy, big, giant, industrial-scale wind, is a profit motive for giant corporations that don't really care about sustainability, don't really care about the future of the planet, or simply after their next bottom line. Whether they can make money in the next quarter or the next half year, and not about the long-term survivability of the planet. The solution on energy is actually to force a reversal Right now, we all have smart cell phones. What is a smart cell phone? It's a phone without a wire. So how come a smart grid is building wires all over the place for the electric grid? The smart way of the future is to have a lot of energy efficiency, to open all the windows up there, because, heck, they have lights on during the day when there's sun coming in, they have windows that don't open, then they need air conditioners to feel comfortable, and that's all taking fossil fuel. The trick is open the windows, use less lights, and put more solar panels on them. I was up on the parking lot. I go up on parking lots a lot to the upper floors of the parking lot, for example, at the Dole Cannery at Evil A, to, to look out at the building, the rooftops. You see the new Home Depot that has just been installed, built there, not a single solar panel on it. The Lowe's, not a single solar panel. We have amazing rooftops. And a number of years ago, I approached Hawaiian Electric and said, why don't we look at how much solar can go on rooftops? And they said, oh, you know, in order to put on solar, you need vacant land and we don't have enough vacant land, therefore we just can't do it. And I kept saying, no, you really got to look at your own rooftop. 
So finally they said, okay, we'll look at our rooftop. So they went with Poku Solar. You know, the company that took 221 funds from us and split to Idaho. Um, they used our tax money to become an end state. They moved to Idaho. Um, Hiko went with Hoku to put solar on the roof. And they thought about it for like three years and finally came back and said they couldn't finance it. Couldn't finance it. The utility gets 99% of its own generators are powered by fossil fuel. A few years ago, they talked about how palm oil would be the savior. You just go to the tropical rainforest like the Amazon, Borneo, chop down the rainforest, grow plantations with palm oil, bring it here, burn it in the refineries, put it in the power plants, and then we'd be sustainable because the planet might not be doing good, but their bottom line would be doing great. Point Electric um, ha has a great racket going. They make a lot of money for themselves. And so I decided that it was, it was silly waiting for them to wake up and see, see the light. Because the bottom line is you can always... The fossil fuel industry is a $3 trillion a year industry. $3 trillion. The largest oil companies make $100 million a day in profit. $100 million in profit. They can afford to take a little bit of that money and buy scientists. Good intentioned scientists good intentioned politicians, good intentioned PR firms, and spin how there's just no solutions out there. So I wrote a book, a book, 150 pages, uh, Wayfinding, Navigating Hawaii's Energy Future. It's now available on the web. Um, www.lifeofthelandhawaii.org The approach is first to move away from central fossil fuel generation as much as possible to rely on renewable energy here on the islands. Hawaii can over the next 10 to 20 years become 90% of our energy from distributed renewable energy and we should be moving towards a system so that in 20 or 25 years, all of our energy is produced on rooftops and we will no longer need the grid. We can dismantle all these power lines that are going up and down the streets and we can rely on on-site generation. This approach terrifies the utility, but in their annual filing with the U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission, they actually put in their annual report that this is a possibility because they're required to disclose that this, this is a possibility coming. We need to push it a little bit faster. Hawaii has the highest electrical rates in the nation. We've had the highest rates for 20 years. The utility brags that they have above average income, above average profit, and they pay their executives very, very well. We have all kinds of renewable energy here. We have great people who have come up with a number of solutions. We just have to implement them. So now I'm going to violate the principles and ask, que ask people to ask questions. Anybody have any questions? You've got to speak into the mic. You've got to come up here, look at the camera, and speak into the mic. I'm unclear about uh, geothermal in the Big Island because before I was uh, against it and then it fired up again, but then uh, Bililani trashed these boards. I don't know, is it a good thing, is it a bad thing, both in terms of the environment and in terms of uh, ownership of the, um, you know, the, the utility itself. Geothermal had a curious history. It's often said that King Kalakaua came up with the idea of geothermal when he talked to Edison. 
I've heard that in the books. You can find it on the web. You can find a hundred sources, a thousand sources, but just not an original source because there was no geothermal anywhere in the world when King Kalakaua lived, and there were no undersea transmission lines anywhere in the world when he lived. So the idea that, that geothermal is somehow belonging to the Hawaii Kingdom and therefore it's okay is a bunch of whatever. Um, geothermal first came about in Italy in 1908. New Zealand was second, and then the United States was third in 1960. We started experimenting with it in Hawaii in 1978. And what we did was we took the steam that comes up with all the toxic materials in it, and after trying to produce electricity from it, we vented it into the atmosphere so that it would flow into residential communities. And needless to say, that created a huge backlash. Then Hawaiian Electric ran a commercial on television where they showed themselves sticking a plug into Madame Pele and said, look, we're tapping. That didn't go over very well. And there was a lot of public outcry over geothermal. Since that time, geothermal has become a lot safer in that you pull it out of the ground, you create electricity, and then you pump the gases back into the ground. So it's a closed system. You're not leaking anything into the atmosphere. So geothermal has sort of made a comeback, but then people began saying, why don't we just violate every environmental law we can find and just run over communities and reintroduce geothermal? And if they had just said, we're going to do it sanely, we're going to talk to the community, everything would have been fine. But this sort of, when the governor comes out and says, there are six minute Hawaiians, the Hawaiians have just popped out of the woodwork and are now protesting. It has created a firestorm against geothermal. Now, geothermal does not exist just in Puna. It also exists on the west side of the Big Island. Hualalai, above Kailua Kona, has geothermal resources. So if the west side of the island needs more energy, and the geothermal is there, why not use that section to explore for the geothermal instead of going into Puna, into the native Hawaiian communities, and trying to run roughshod over that community. So geothermal has its place, but it should not be done in a disrespectful way. Exactly. I actually like the idea of geothermal. Um, at the same time, though, in the places that geothermal has been set up, to today's standards, the environment normally pays a price. Um, yes, the gases can be pumped back into the land. However, those gases do come back up and kind of poison the land that's around it. The other problem with geothermal that is in current technology is the methods by which they drill and the types of petroleum products that they use to maintain those drills while they are making those wells. In the future, maybe geothermal will be cooler. But with the current technologies, I would really have to take a second look at it. Chris raises a good point, and I should have addressed it in my original talk. Every environmental, every energy product that we use worldwide, every one has cultural impacts, everyone has environmental impacts. You can't escape it. For example, wind systems require very powerful magnets. The magnets use trace minerals. The minerals are dug up in places like China, which has enormous resources, and probably people here can guess the other country with enormous resources. It accounts for why we invaded them, Afghanistan. So you have to pull up these trace minerals from the ground, pour acid over them. In China, they just pour acid in the public and leave the acid lakes all over the place because they don't have environmental laws. Then we get the wind farms here and everything is cool because we're renewable and their place has been polluted. Solar also, some solar is made with arsenic, some solar panels. 
So every form of energy has can be made in a very destructive way. And if we're going to use energy, we have to find the most benign sources and and use them in the most environmentally safe ways. But there is no way of avoiding environmental impacts for any energy source. The uh, state of Hawaii, um, uh, fake state, as everyone knows, um, there is a common law, mm -hmm. and that common law is in that common law. There is such a thing as Hawaiian usage and the Hawaii Revised Statutes, and that is Native Hawaiians have um, have uh, rights to water. So when Henry said that there is steam. We, I learned this in 1974. 1974, a lot of the engineers and scientists uh, had a meeting here over at Turtle Bay, and that's how I got to know this particular thing. Simply said, steam is water and water is steam. So therefore, that's how the whole Native Hawaiian or Hawaiian uh, got involved into geothermal. I was sitting at the University of Hawaii before everyone decided to go over to Big Island and do that protest. I was there listening to all the, the things that was coming about protesting against geothermal. Um, the other part simply said was that they were going to use the volcano as a means to dump all these toxicities into volcano and it'll just burn burn within the volcano, um, in, in the Pele. Uh, coal. Uh, nowadays, we're noticing that we're all, like Pelly, incorporating and in, inducing into our bodies all the toxicity that's in the air. So those two simple things we were concerned with way back in the 70s when it came down to Girothomo. So when we got together, we just said, Aoli, you know, until you come back with a, to us with a better plan. So. That's how the native Hawaiian, uh, the Hawaiians got involved into Jerusalem. It was steam is water and water is steam. They just didn't want to pay us for the usage of the steam. That's our water that they're using. Okay, so that was the the crux of the problem as far as we participating in there. So, in answer to Mililani's uh, question. And I, I should point out one other thing about geothermal. Um, unlike California, California has the peak energy use when the sun is above us. We have our peak energy use after the sun is set. Therefore, there are three chief ways of providing power in the evening when you need it. One is geothermal because you can always produce power that way. Second is ocean thermal, playing off the temperature differentials of the ocean. The third is to use the reservoirs that we have, the drinking well reservoirs and natural lakes that we have, and to use solar and wind when it's available to pump water uphill and then to drop it in the evening. That's called pump storage hydro. And pump storage hydro is a major, accounts for 99% of all the energy storage on the mainland and it's possible here. I don't think we really need hydrothermal, uh, geothermal. Uh, we have all kinds of energy sources all, all around us, especially on Hawaii. You know, I'm, I'm working for a whole of solar right now. I know that uh, our project engineers, we decide, we figure out how many panels a roof needs and it doesn't take the whole roof to zero out an electric grid. Okay, there's, there's wind ideas that can be utilized on a roof of a house as well. There's all kinds of other other uses without taking a chance of GSO. Uh, we just don't know what that is. If we do take the risk of trying to utilize geothermal on a large basis, my opinion is uh, we'd be better off having it in the hands of the government that doesn't automatically have a profit motive involved um, instead of any any player in the class that has input on that. What um, he's referring to about zeroing out your bill is if you put on enough solar panels on your roof 
so that you're supplying twice as much energy as you need during the peak of the day. You're selling your excess to the grid. Then in the evening, you pull out from the grid when the sun isn't shining. And on average, you produce the same amount of energy as you needed, and therefore your bill is zero. But for the grid, the problem is that if everybody is putting solar in during the day and pulling out at night, that energy has to come from somewhere at night. In the evening, where we have our maximum energy use, is typically in time without sun and without wind. So you need some other energy source for that evening period. And the, a solar panel has the maximum output around 10, 11 in the morning to about 3 in the afternoon. It begins dying down to the evening towards at night where it's producing nothing. So you need some source to make up for that. You want to hop the line? Hello, uh, I have a few questions for you. One is, uh, I recently became aware of solar thermal energy, for, um, uh, which uh, uses the heat of the sun instead of just the light to produce energy, which if people don't know is being used, is being experimented on in great success in the USA, in the Mojave Desert. My question is, uh, what do you know about it and can it be used in here in Hawaii? And the other thing is, what do you <clears throat> have to say about the politics of moderation of energy use, about using bicycles and not using electronics so much in the evening, and grow, uh, doing urban gardening? Um, what, what do you have to say to people who, like here at Occupy, I notice a lot of people who feel connected to their computers and just can't get off of the laptops and the cell phones. What do you, do you have any words of advice of how to use electricity wisely instead of just use, 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 and who cares where the energy comes from. Sorry, Thank you stream. <laughs> I'm devoted to you guys. <laughs> Your first question dealt with concentrated solar power. I'm using power. both just so I can In show this. In its simplest form, you can take a parabolic mirror, and sunlight is hitting it from many different directions, and you focus it on a pipe with molten salt in it. You can heat the pipe and the molten salt will stay warm for a long time, and in the evening when the sun is set, it can produce electricity. That is one real possibility for the future. It works most ideally in the desert of the southwest, where the temperatures are much hotter, and the molten salt can heat to 1,000 degrees Celsius. Here in Hawaii, it does not work as well. There is a local company called Sofigy, S-O-P-O-G-Y, that is in investigating it at a local level. They have systems, very small, that can go on rooftops. Um, but the problem is that because we have lower temperatures, because we have more salt in the atmosphere, um, the cost of, of making thermal energy and using it in the nighttime is very expensive. It's being tested right now near the Kehole Airport on the Big Island, but it, it's not anywhere cost-effective right now. The second question is, why can't we all conserve? We could, but the problem is that most people want somebody else to conserve. And as an example, um, I've been to a number of renewable energy conferences, and I've said to renewable energy people throughout them, solar, wind, geothermal, everybody, we're all advocating change we're about to have a coffee break. Let's come back and sit in a different seat. After 10 conferences, I've gotten one person to move one seat because everybody wants somebody else to change and someone else to conserve. So while it's good to conserve, I don't think it's going to be a... It can't be done by itself as the only solution. Um, it, it, it's, for example, how many of you go to the restroom at a, in, um, in your building, and the first thing you do is you throw on the switch. Now, most of you can figure out where the toilet is or where the urinal is, and you know where your equipment is, and sometimes there's light coming in the window, but the first reaction is always to throw the switch. So, conservation is something that is great. It's a long-term strategy to get people to start being more aware of the world around them but it's not going to be something that tomorrow we can get the world to change.
The second problem with conservation is it's a lot easier to sell something to people if you say you can do what you are doing now and save money. It's a lot harder to say you have to cut back. Uh, somehow cutting back is not American, not Hawaiian. We tend to like to waste energy just as a as society. So yes, it's great in the long term. Yes, we need to figure out ways of encouraging it, but no, it won't solve our problems tomorrow. Line. Well, first of all, I, I appreciate uh, the talk that you're giving, but you had mentioned several other forms to be able to get our energy from, and I was wondering what your thoughts on using thorium as an energy source rather than geothermal, solar, or wind. Yeah. Um, so thorium is it's a nuclear material that was discovered uh, around the same time as plutonium, but through political reasons it was never really developed because you can't make a bomb out of thorium, but it's already, it's already in its melted state, which makes it incredibly safe. It burns at like almost 90%, and then the, uh, the leftover material doesn't have to be stored anywhere near as long as uranium. Um, it, it really started to get, gain traction when the, uh, in the space program because it's, it's naturally occurring. Um, and there's massive deposits of it on the moon, which would solve energy needs for something like, like a moon base, where you wouldn't have to actually bring uh, a material in to create energy. But it's, it's naturally occurring, and it's, it's all over the United States. In fact, we have the second largest deposit of thorium in the world here in the United States. Um, there are two issues with nuclear, of, of any form of nuclear. One is that in 1978 we amended the state constitution to say that we will not use nuclear in the state. So it has a very, very high level of, um, there is, you can get like a two-thirds vote in each chamber if you want to overturn that, but there have been nuclear bills introduced every year in the legislature. Panos is a major proponent of nuclear. Um, it has never passed out of a single committee of either the House or the Senate. One of the problems with nuclear is, in order to make it cost effective, you have to put in a large system. For example, if you were going to use uranium, the size of the plant to make it cost effective would be if you got all of the state's energy from one nuclear power plant. All of the energy from one plant, so you need to put cables to all the islands, and you'd be relying on one plant. The problem is a nuclear power plant has to be taken down one month a year for maintenance and occasionally it crashes. So you have to maintain the entire renewable or entire energy system that we have now for that time when the nuclear plant is down for maintenance. So it presents an enormous, it presents a couple of enormous problems. All right, so my name's Adam, and um, I just want to go over a couple of different uh, uh, energy sources that you were talking about. You had the solar, which is great, you know, green, or green, whatever. It only works 50% of the time, not very effective, right? So then you had your geothermal, which works off uh, the earth or whatever, you know, and the heat source and the steam, whatever. And it's great, but it could be possibly detrimental. And nuclear is definitely detrimental, and science should have probably try to stay out of it. Why don't we use something that works 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and keeps you put on this earth? There's some magnetism. I mean, a magnetic propulsion engine posed by Nikolai Tesla before Thomas Edison in the smear campaign put its, bought out its rights and put it to rest 110 years ago to wipe out possibly the grid and keep it powered for free, forever. A magnetic propulsion engine would run forever and feed into the system. Two issues with that which are really interesting. First, Tesla is an interesting character if you go back and look at him. Because for some reason, Edison is the person we all remember. Edison did not have the first generator, although he's often credited with putting the first generator in New York City that led the United States to become 
having electric power. His first one was in New Jersey. New York City's was Europe had electricity 25 years before the United States did. There's a lot of myths around Edison, Westinghouse, and Tesla, the big three people who brought us energy. Edison is somehow very popular. He knew how to make himself popular. So he's the person we remember, and we named all our utilities Con Edison, New York Edison, Southern California Edison, after him. He's the guy who came up with the electric chair. Um, he, he, he came up with a lot of ideas, some of them smart, some of them dumb, and we don't tend to remember Westinghouse and Tesla, who developed the transmission system that we have, alternating current, where we build power plants far, far away, and we have these massive transmission lines bringing them in. That is Westinghouse and Tesla. Now, Tesla also proposed all kinds of other things, and some of them dealt with magnetism. But if you look at his speeches and his writings, he was awfully very vague on what he was saying, and all sorts of things have been attributed to him. So magnetism might work, it might not work. There's a lot of speculation that it could work. But let's flip the coin around to the other side. How many people here really want free energy? There's a catch. We have cheap energy from 1750 to, to 2000, 250 years. We were able to find first coal and then petroleum and then natural gas to find ways of having relatively cheap energy and then to have petroleum and electricity which could move energy around to different places. And what did the relatively cheap energy do? It increased world population sevenfold. People no longer had to work in agriculture because there was mechanization. So they flooded to the cities. We began to have more and more cities and mega cities and more and more urban slums. Cheap energy has dramatically transformed the world. In 1900, 93% of the world population lived in towns of 5,000 or less. We were, people had agriculture, people were self-sufficient, there was a lot. In the last 100 years, we have made vast transformations. Cheap energy has enabled that to occur. If we had free energy for the next 100 years, we could increase the population of the world to 40 billion. We would put enormous stress on every sector of the rest of the world. So I'm not really in favor of cheap energy. Um, there are a lot of unintended consequences from that. Aloha. I respect everything you do and what you've been about, especially uh, towards uh, you know, and the people. And basically, the feel of the island. Um, you're very educated and you have brilliant points of view, but this part was something special to me and I think it might also have a little bit of meaning to you that's kind of overlooked in this whole discussion of whose territory is this? La Hoi Hoi Ea was to represent something very special that's been kind of uh, buried. And I think you have some information about that, what it's about, but also about something that your group, our group, is going to be involved in that's very important. And as far as pushing an issue, this stands true to, to everybody here and what this park is about. Could you please share that? If you look, and I'm sorry, this might, the first sentence might sound boring, but it's very important. The state economy is about $70 billion. If you add up all the goods...